After five months away, back for 2022 is the Michelin Le Mans Cup with round one taking place here at Circuit Paul Ricard under beautiful skies, clear blue as far as the eye can see. A little blustery here and there, as you can tell by the flags on top of the iconic pit lane building with Paul Ricard stamped on the front. Lucas Delay, the first calling point for the Michelin Le Mans Cup. We will be going to Italy twice, in fact, to Imola and Monza. Slotty between those two meetings, the two races at Le Mans as part of the Road to Le Mans event and to Belgium and to Portugal as well. Plenty up for grabs, two different titles, well, four if you include the drivers, across two separate classes, GT3 and a massive LMP3 field for this season. Situated right next to Le Castellet Airport, this uh, high-tech test track, which has re become once again a Grand Prix venue a couple of seasons ago, is our first stop-off then, uh, and first of two within France itself. Confirmation of the calendar then. Uh, Le Castellet to kick things off. In a month's time, we'll then travel to Emilia-Romagna and to Imola. Welcome return to the calendar for that Italian circuit. Le Mans for the two races, the shortened 55 five-minute races, and then uh, Monza, Spa and Portimao to finish things off. And a reminder that the standard bread and butter races that were two hours have been slightly shortened as well for season 2022 to an hour and 50 minutes. A reminder of the track that we will be competing on today, 5.7 kilometres of it, but it offers all sorts of different sectors. The Mistral straight, which is pedal to the metal, no chicanes being used once again this year, but tight and twisty technical sectors one and three really do mean that you need to hit a compromise when you're setting up the car. It's not just my voice, Johnny Palmer, that you'll be hearing, but Graham Goodwin joins me again. Uh, obviously, you were on stream with me for qualifying earlier on. The LMP3 is particularly busy. But Torsten Kratz in what might appear like a lone Duquesne in a mix of well, 12 Ligiers that followed really did the business for WTM Racing. Toughed it out, didn't he? And it is a, a tale of two different uh, routes to a setup here at Paul Ricard. That much has been emerging through the week. It's certainly emerging through the weekend. The, the teams and the cars that are trimmed out for high speed. Down
He uh, used to race amongst the, amongst other things the LMP 900 Lister Storm. Yeah. Uh, amazing stories here in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. It is a step on the ladder for teams and for drivers and for racing ambitions. But to get up that ladder, you've got to get the business done. In just a few minutes' time, we're going to see how successful these drivers are in doing exactly that. Well, it was Jens Moller who did the business in the number 44 Honda NSX from the GMB Motorsport crew. He put in a time of 156. 0.314. Teammate Christian Paulson was only 0.4 of a second slower. They didn't quite get the full set though of Honda NSX's topping the charts because um, Lars Engelbrecht Pedersen just missed out after Emanuele Busnelli, a former champion at GT3 level. Allons, enfants de la partie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Contre nous. A striking rendition of Le Marseillaise then here at, uh, well, just about an hour's drive away from Marseille and, uh, well, really gets you in the mood, doesn't it? It does, rather. Ahead of, uh, indeed, a European Championship but with his heart in France and we will have three races in total this season in uh, its homeland for uh, the ACO and LMEM who look after this championship. Speaking of which, here's some of the big wigs. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's neither a wig nor big, but it's, it's Pierre Fion, the ACO president and the man in charge of the organisation that organises not only the Le Mans 24 Hours but also the European Le Mans series, the Michelin Le Mans Cup, Frédéric Lequian, his CEO of LMEM, which is a joint venture between the ACO and the FIA, and also, of course, the FI World Endurance Championship, that truly is the organisation that has got its roots into and through world sports car racing. Total Energy is there on the grid, and they're going to be overseeing the debut in the Michelin Le Mans Cup uh, competition of this new Excellium Racing 100 fuel uh, that will be powering these cars. And much as there's been a little bit of chatter, by the way, uh, pre-season about the calorific content of that, that fuel, uh, Total Energy is telling us yesterday, Johnny, no change in the kind of stint times that are going to be done by the cars up and down the grids. Uh, with this, something like a 2% difference, which will mean, for instance, at Le Mans, for the uh, the leading cars, still going to be 11 laps on a tank of fuel. So we're not going to see a reduction in stint times, something we expected might happen. So that's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, Romain Aubry uh, really giving us a, the, the rundown of this new fuel, biofuel, and he said that one of the main pieces of the brief was that the 11 lap stint time for LMP2s had to be retained at Le Mans, and then that transcends into you know the relevant stint lengths at these individual events, not for this round, I realise, but for tomorrow's ELMS opener. Yep. We should still be looking at 45 minutes or so for a stint P2, yep. in P2, um, and these cars, well, because of the engine differences that came in a couple of years ago, the race distance has been shortened, but that's nothing to do with the fuel that powers the Nissan 5.6 litre V8, more to do with the fact that they rather burn through that biofuel rather rapidly. You're looking at the empty stands to one side. Those stands not open to the public here this weekend, but as you can see on top of the pit building, there's plenty of people watching from that vantage point. And also from the Extreme Park, which is uh, the multi-purpose arena uh, that uh, facility that surrounds the outer part of the arena section if you like of this circuit uh, free entry there to the public and there's a fair number of people have turned up to get their first taste of live sports car racing in many many months and boy are they a welcome sight great to welcome the public back and those barriers brought in by the pandemic are coming down and not very slowly <laughs> 
understandably so. It's been a long, long time. Now, CR Cruz and Dino Lunardi caught sight of their car a moment or two ago. Charles qualifying the car in fourth position and will be joined by Italian driver for the race. Uh, Alexander Matschel and Tom Dillman, Frenchman, joining G German driver Matschel, who had to do the qualifying as per the regs because it's a bronze only session. Yep, Tom Dillman has uh, been another man who's raced at the very top of sports car racing, hopes to do so again. But, uh, we'll wait to see whether or not that's going to be possible with the current places intending to race. Lots going on here. This is a story, you know, up and down this grid. It's not been tokenist. There are just more female faces in this pit lane, in this paddock, yeah. and in increasingly senior positions, and that's a delight to see. Yeah, but also, you know, chatter between teams who, will, who are about to be stern rivals out on the racetrack, but uh, racing spirit of Le Mans, having a chat to Edex Sport and wishing them well. I'm sure if they're door handle to door handle, they won't be sending out the same message. No. Dear me, MV2S Forestier Racing, a rebranding of the MV2S squad, stepped back from a single car entry in the LMS to a two car entry here in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Just one of the stories around here, you mentioned already, Johnny, the WTM car now in the hands of Rinaldi Racing. So both the two teams on the front row for starters coming with a slightly different package. Torsten Kratz, it will be, it will start this race with an advice to take over the car later. These teams, by the way, several of them, already done plenty of LMP3 racing so far this year. And uh, in the mix, uh, WTM Racing for the Asian Le Mans Series in February, also on this grid, CD Sports, who took that title. Five-minute board is up, and it's not going to be very long before we're underway for what is going to be an extremely exciting season. In the wheelchair there, just behind the gentleman, from the car, that is Gilles Duquet. It is his name on the badge. There's Gilles, no mean racer himself. Uh, he was one of the, the drivers in the very first season of GT3 racing. And Gilles, with a hand controlled Dodge Viper of all things, and did very well indeed. And this is his car, the Duquesne. Duquesne Engineering taking over the project initially started by Norma, now branded, of course, in its new evolution as Duquesne D08. And that is the man with his name over the door. Yeah, so there are um, a mixture of Duquesne and Ligier. Predominantly the chassis that a lot of teams have picked is the Ligier, and that's maybe the reason why it is dominant in the top 13, apart from that one outlier, which is the pole car. And it's a question of how long Torsten Kratz and Leo Weiss can stay there. In this equivalent meeting last year, they qualified seventh and finished 11th. Now, I would say they've already made strides yep. year on year looking at their pace, and particularly 50-year-old Torsten Kratz, who clearly has made this, this circuit one of his favourites. And this is what we've seen, Johnny, through this LMP3 formula. It is a, another step on the... Uh, the ladder, the, the sports car racing pyramid, we've just commentated on the Ligier European Series, a relatively new addition and a lower rung on the ladder, but we see it constantly. Whether or not it's a 50-year-old driver like Torsten Kratz, a 16-year-old driver, um, those drivers, those teams, unpicking the Rubicon of LMP3 and finding ways to just drag the best out of this package. And in the second and the third year, very often what we see if something just comes together, is this going to be a year for WTM or are they going to be swallowed by this pack of 24 Ligiers behind them? Let's have a look at the grid then. Torsten Kratz set the time earlier today, 150.508 to put WTM on pole alongside MV2S, Forestieri Racing and uh, Jerome de Sadelier making a first run into ACO rules racing from years of doing radicals. Alex Matchell and Charles Cruz come next on the second row. Then Fabrice Rosselli and Freddie Hunt for Graf Racing and Ryder Engineering. Fabian Michal, who had a big spin at Turn 1 for CD Sport alongside John Schaumann and United Auto Sports. It's Graf Racing, Louis Saint of Switzerland alongside RLRM Sports Martin Rich number 53 then Morris Smith cool racing came so close to last year's title ran short by just a couple of points Auden Goodmanson of Team Tor next Tony Wells is the defending champion with co-driver Colin Noble for Nielsen Racing they start 13th alongside Rinaldi Racing Steve Parrow it's Alexander Bukantsov of DKR Engineering alongside Pietro Peccinini Jacques Wolf for Racing Spirit of Le Mans and Christoph Kri 
Crespin, the second of the MV2S racing cars. Then Nielsen Racing's John Melsom, also in the wars a little bit in qualifying, but did recover Alexander Taukanitsa for uh, Talcon, it's a senior for 80 racing next. Daniel Schneider and then Mark Crader. Mark Crader's changed teams, although kept the race number 20 from Grain Market Racing to Optimum Motorsport. ANS Motorsport, Jonathan Brossard and Fricadelli Racing Team Class Abilan. Then it's Sean Lynn and Rob Hodes for United Auto Sports and Team Virage. They used to be teammates. And then Alexander Yvon with. Andres Latour, Virage and United respectively. John Branson for DKR Engineering and Air Courses, uh, Crichton Lentudis. We're down into the GT3s now on the graphics. Jens Moller with the pole sitting time for one of three Honda NSXs from JMB Motorsport. So Moller starts alongside Christian Poulsen. Emanuele Busnelli for Ebi Motors. He's a former champion at GT3 level, 2017 champ in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Lars Engelbrecht Pedersen, also in a, J, uh, in a GMB Motorsport NSX. Two AF Corsa Ferraris. Gino Forgioni to start the 61 alongside Marcus Vivian Della Pedrosa in 51, and finally uh, Stephen Patrick in the bullet racing all black number 99 Aston Martin uh, will start from seventh place in GT3. I make that 38 cars about to get rolling and spot on time. This race due to be off at 4.40 local. We're four minutes away from that and it will run all the way through till 6.30 this evening. 22.7 degrees Celsius is the ambient temperature. It'll be quite a bit warmer than that at track level because we've had a lot of sunshine today but we've also had quite a lot of Michelin tyre uh, go down together with the uh, tyre constructor. We won't mention them just yet because this is the Michelin Le Mans Cup after all. But uh, plenty of grip out there. It's also, though, rather greasy and gravelly offline potentially. So, got to be careful through traffic. 31 LMP3 cars and seven GT3 cars make their way from the grid onto the formation lap for this opening round of the 2022 Michelin Le Mans Cup. We'll pick up some of the dozens, hundreds of stories thus far, even before a racing lap has been turned, as we see these cars make their way around. The second of the MV2S cars, the orange-themed car, we've already seen the green car there, second on the grid. The white car just coming through the turn there, Writer Engineering with their first LMP efforts. Hans Geiter, known for his exploits with Lamborghini GT cars and KTM GT cars, now fancies a go at Le Mans, and this is his first step on that journey. Amongst the drivers for that car, and in fact starting the car, Freddie Hunt, son of the late James Hunt, from the One World Champion, of course, and Freddie put in a very good time indeed in qualifying. We've got a car in the pit lane, Graham. It's the 66 Steve Paro Rinaldi racing machine, which oh either didn't get out uh, or they've had to push it back into pit road. But I think probably it didn't make the closure of the pit lane. It is shown on our screen in 14th position, but it would appear it's not there. Right. And having to start from pit road, possibly a lap down as well. well keep an eye on that, see what uh, the story is there. Just look at this little lot. <laughs> As far them. as the eye can see, I mean, it's not a whole of the Mistral straight, which appears to be weaving. In a moving. Uh, four United Auto Sports car, a record for them in a non Le Mans car. There is Steve Paro waiting at pit out. Optima Motorsport making their first entry into LMP3 alongside their GTE and GT3 efforts. They're here with a Duquesne. Uh, the Grain Market Racing entry, as was last year, moves to Optima Motorsport. So many stories. Fricadelli Racing Team here with a late addition. Klaus Avalon to start. Felipe Laza will join him. So Felipe, of course, is part of the Proton Competition efforts in the LMS. He's the driver coach for Michael Fassbender. Mm. And then we get into the GT cars. Three Danish entered Hondas. A pair of A, of course, uh, Ferraris. The bullet racing Aston Martin, a beautiful looking car that is. And then the EV Motors late replacement Porsche for their Lamborghini Huracan. That story when we get an opportunity to tell it. 
But Torsten Kratz now looking to, well, for the pace car to dictate the pace for him. And said Audi will move to the right-hand side of the track very shortly to head down pit road. And that will leave the job of keeping the pace to Torsten Kratz and Jerome de Sandalia alongside him, the 33-year-old Swiss driver, elder brother of Hugo de Sandalia, former LMP2 racer with United Order Sports. Alexander Maxchel alongside Charles Cruz, and then it'll be Fabrice Rosselli and Freddie Hunt on the third row for Graf Racing and Writer Engineering, respectively. It's been quite a wait over five months, but now we are about to get rolling. The 2022 Michelin Le Mans Cup is about to get started at Lucas Delay. The red lights are out and we are racing. away for Torsten Kratz. He has got the jump on Jerome de Sandelier. Does everybody else squeeze through on cold tyres? There's a big wiggle from uh, Alexander Maxwell, I reckon, but he just about weathers the storm and making ground well. Freddie Hunt in the writer engineering car. That's the all-white machine up to fourth position. Fifth place, I reckon, is Charles Cruz. And in sixth position, Fabrice Rosselli. will confirm those spots in a moment or two, but then shuffled out wide Freddie Hunt as Charles Cruz slots by on his right-hand side, but Torsten Kratz will have been thinking about this start for many hours since he took pole position just before lunchtime, and he has fended off the advances of all of those Ligier JSP 320s. Yeah, Freddie Hunt, brilliant start from him, but then a bit over-aggressive as he tried to take another, play, uh, another bite, and big, big wiggle as he went off track in trying to get past... Back past uh, Charlie Cruz, and Charlie Cruz had seen the move coming earlier in the lap. And that's uh, it's just Freddie needs to just calm down, get himself dialed in here. He's right in front of the CD Sport car here, but that was almost absolute disaster. You do not want to see a car moving from left to right at that sort of speed down the Mistral straight. It would be very easy for air to get underneath the car and it to be lifted off the ground, although the dorsal fin in more recent years has helped to prevent that from happening. He did incredibly well after he rattled the curves to hang on to that. The steering wheel will have been uh, jumping out of his hands at the time. So he has lost places, Freddie Hunt, but not that many, all things considered, slipping behind John Showerman for United Auto Sports in his number 23 car, who's up to sixth place one lap about to be completed you'll notice that the car in the pit lane still has not been released steve parrow will get the green light at the end of well the run for all of these cars into turn one for the second time and it is as i thought he has to join the race a full lap down to be as safe as possible rather than launch his car from the pit lane into a potential accident on the first lap jens waller meanwhile has been making uh, progress up through some of the back markers in lmp3 there is the Red Honda, the McDonald's branding on the front of that car. The fastest of the GT3 cars. A bit roughed up there a little bit, but uh, he's more than up for this fight. He's been around a long time, Jens Muller. Here come the other two. So it's a 1 2 3 at the moment for the. No, it's not. It's a 1 2 4 for the Hondas because the EP Motors Porsche, difficult to miss there, we've got a dark night, that one. Then the two Ferraris and the bullet, Aston Martin, right in the wheel tracks of the second of the Ferraris, that's the AF Corsa, number 51 car. Steve Parrow's in the race for Rinaldi Racing. He joins from the pit lane car 66, so we have the full complement of 38 cars now. Torsten Kratz in the only Duquesne in the top 12 positions, leads by 1.3 seconds over Jerome de Sadelier for MV2S Forestier Racing. Then it's Racing Spirit of Le Mans. Alexander Maxwell's done well to hang on to that place when he was almost shuffled down the order. And Charles Cruz, likewise, for Edex Sport. Fabrice Rossello stays holding station in fifth. John Sharman has taken the advantage, though, after that wayward moment for Freddie Hunt. So Sharman gains a spot, and Freddie Hunt loses two. Uh, then it's Fabien Michel for CD Sport, Louis saint joan for Graf Racing, the second of their cars in the top nine, and r and RM Sports Martin Rich completes the top ten, with GMB Motorsports Jens Moller able to put four LMP3 cars between him and his teammate car, Christian Poulsen. That is quite a buffer zone this early on in an hour and 50-minute race. Watch Freddie Hunt here to the inside. It's fifth at the point at which the... the 
lights go green, but it doesn't stay fifth for long. It's a good move to the inside here at Turn 1. After that, it started to go a little bit wrong a couple of corners later. He was quite possibly caught on the wrong side, but you can't help which side of the grid you qualify. So he had the outside line into turn one. Up to third there. Did OK there, actually, sweeping across around the outside of a couple. It was here, went to the outside, went too wide, over one of the, the sausage curbs, I think, and nearly lost the car, did well to recover that. There were, well, there were a couple of really tough floppies that he caught and the kerb, and when you smack a serrated kerb at that sort of speed, that is how unsettled the car can get and uh, tough to control because that will have come with very little warning indeed. When you are so close to a car in front, easy to lose where the very edge of the track is. Anyway, disaster averted and Freddie Hunt running in seventh position ahead of Louis saint -Jouin. Martin Rich, Mo Smith for cool racing. Mo will be disappointed with his start so far, but there is chance to improve yet. And when we get to the driver changes, he will be handing over to Malta Jakobsen, who has been a star already today. Yeah, that's going to be something to see. Malta is up for this or any other fight uh, involving a wheel at each corner of an LMP3 car right now. Good battle developing for sixth position, involving John Schaumann, a recovering Freddie Hunt, and also the CD Sport car in there of Fabian Michal, a Frenchman for the Spanish outfit. Good. Michal's got company as well. Good to see CD Sport recovering their season. Came out of the Asian Le Mans series, taking a 1-2 in that championship, but with no other plans. It looked as if their success there has garnered a bit of support. They've got this Michelin Le Mans Cup programme and will be at the Mon and LMP2 car. Good middle sector pace, that's the Mistral straight, remember, for the Nielsen racing car of John Melsom, just doing the fastest middle sector of anybody so far at a 29.2. But uh, Jerome de Sadelia is gaining a bit of ground on the overall race leader, Torsten Kratz, two, uh, two tenths of a second in that short first sector. You mentioned John Melton in that middle sector. That's a great example of what we're talking about at the start of the race, Johnny. Clearly a car that's been trimmed for speed. 284 kilometres an hour uh, as we've got uh, two cars are going to get a jump, uh, a drive through penalties. It's going to go to car 88 and car 44. Two of the three J, uh, GMB Hondas. 44 leads the GT3 category and very convincingly as well. But both have been pinged for not false starts, so they were in the correct position, but they've gone before the red lights were extinguished by the sounds of things. Drive through penalty, so not stop and goes. Nevertheless, that's going to severely dent their run. Two of the three GMB motorsport cars pinged for that. Indeed. So to complete the point, 285 kilometres an hour to the speed trap on the Mistral for John Melson. Compare that to the race leader at 278 and the second place car at 276. What it's not producing is the better lap times because those cars have clearly been set up uh, to be quicker in the twisty bits in sectors one and three. As, as has, you would think, Jerome de Sadelier's car because new purple times first and third sector now for the Swiss. But not second. That's the clear, the, the clear indicator. Yeah. He's got a very, very quick lap but not able to produce the, the speed down the main straight. Yeah, 152.036 becomes the new fastest lap of the race but... Not enough at the Trouble. moment. Now, is that John Sharman? Yeah, it is from sixth position. John Sharman's had a spin, or worse, maybe some contact at turn number one. So single-wave yellow flags plus the LED boards are flashing to warn everyone of the stricken car. Just the other side of those cones, in comes the 44 from the GT3 race lead to do a drive-through penalty after that jump start for Jens Moller. And that will gift the race lead to his teammate Christian Poulsen, who is the GMB motorsport car that did not receive a penalty, all on his own for John Schaumann. Identical to what we saw earlier, the, uh, earlier today in, uh, in the, uh, was it the free practice session or qualifying? Quali. Qualifying, we saw two cars do almost exactly the same thing. Yeah. And that was well, well avoided, by, uh, by the way, there by Freddie Hunt. If you approach turn one too wide, there is a big jump there, a, a bump in the road, I think, and yeah. it really unsettles the car. Um, yes, it, it might be down to, you know, turn in point as well and how violent you are as, as you turn in for the left-hander at turn one, Derrier, to give it its uh, official name, but 
um, it's just no getting that back because there's so little warning. The, the rear overtakes the front and you're off the road. Thankfully, nowhere close to anything solid for John Chapman, and he will be able to rejoin, but a load of places lost because of that. Good start from Stephen Patrick. He's gone by one of the Ferraris. He's got the 44 car that's been through pit lane behind him as well, and is now in the wheel tracks, the second of the GMB Motorsports Hondas, the number 88 car, and looking racy. Here comes the recovering 44 car has served its drive-through penalty, has already passed the 51. Leading, then, is the 55. 44 has still got to pit. Pretty close there between the 51A, of course, to Ferrari and an LMP3 to Bosa. I think it was Steve Parrow start, starting his uh, recovery drive-through. That would deep, make sense. Up the inside from the number four car. Despite the colour scheme, by the way, we'll have to get used to this. That is a Nielsen racing car. The number four, it is their new effort. John Nelson showing with Matt Bell. Team Tour, great to see the Icelandic team back. And that is in front of one of a pair of almost identically liveried DKR machines, the 14 car that we'll later on see runs her aboard. No, it's the other one, sorry, he's not in the 14. My apologies. Her DKR will be shared by, uh, well, Bukansov starting, James Winslow to take it over, who is a gold. You are permitted golds, but not platinums in your combination, but you only get one, the other must be a bronze, and that is the job of Alexander Bukansov. So here comes the second of the errant Hondas, down through pit lane. That will gift bullet another position up into fourth place for the Matt Black and Strident Red Aston Martin. That's a team that's had their travails this week. Pretty major incident, uh, pretty innocent spin for Stephen Patrick, then collected by an unsighted Lawrence Herr. That uh, caused the team no end of trouble. They switched to their spare car, but they didn't have all the bits. And it's been a search across Europe to get that done. And it's to their credit and the credit of the international racing community that's pulled together and made that happen. Bits and pieces all over for this. I'm not going to say it's a trigger's broom of a car. <laughs> but we know what you mean. But uh, way wide for both of those cars. 44 car on its recovery drive. Went around the Aston Martin. Jens Muller, the more experienced of the two drivers. Yeah, so Stephen Patrick kind of knew the game was up there into senior corner and didn't make uh, the task for Jens Moller any more difficult than it needed to be. 61 Ferrari for Giorgio Forgione is now being shown as stopped. I think that's a sticky transponder, though, because all of a sudden it pops back up to third position for Forgione. So maybe it's just not triggering the loops as it should do. Ebi Motors, Emanuele Pusnelli ahead of uh, the first of the two AF Corsa Ferraris. And Jens Moller will be labelling 61 as it's as his next target. Jens Moller, by the way, uh, 14 seconds off the lead after the drive-through penalty. So making very good progress in time. Lights flashing for the TS Corsa car, being driven by Pietro Peccinini. For Alexander Bukansov just ahead, the Emirati-flagged driver. So this is the... It's two of the decaying side by side there down the Mistral. TS Corsa, a first time full season entry. They were here each race, but uh, late additions therefore were not eligible for points last year. It's good to see the Italian squad in the mix. So WTM Racing lead the race from MV2 S for SDA Racing. Racing Spirit are on Edict Sport, Graf, CD Sports and then the second graph car. Both the graph cars are in the top seven at the moment. And then Martin Rich will be doing half of this season in that uh, RLRM Sport car, Martin, the 53 car. The other th half of the season will be fulfilled by the racing reverend, uh, Simon Butler, and a huge amount of uh, media interest back at home in the UK from Simon. We had Breakfast TV here during the test to interview him. And uh, he is indeed a racing vicar. He's a vicar by trade, has a parish to look after. This is what he's doing with his sabbatical time and has been pictured uh, in his full robes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the a couple of, I think, the Son of the Dead Express this week. 
Well, it's understandable he's not racing this weekend then, because you'd imagine he's got a fairly full schedule, it being Easter, but he will be back for uh, a few races later on in the season. So it could be good, good to see what's going on with that one. Here's a bit of a tussle between the number two and the number 28. So car two, has this now become the best of the United Autosport cars with, unfortunately, that spin for John Showerman? Uh, Just about. Might be. Yes. So uh, that's uh, disappointing for the Yorkshire no, squad. second one, uh, Daniel Schneider. Oh, is Brazilian driver, yeah. Up in 18th position. And while we're talking about the 32 car, if you're listening, Emily Merrick, our thoughts are with you and your family. And you can't be here this weekend as a family emergency. And we're thinking of you. We'll see you at the next race. Look forward to that in Imola. So Daniel Schneider, Brazilian, uh, 32, car 32, running in 19th, as you say. Then Klaus Avalan for Frickadelli Racing Team, Jonathan Brossard for ANS Motorsport, and then Sean Lynn. So where has John Sharman slipped to? 25th place okay. for car number 23. That was a costly spin. 61 car, the EP Motors car running wide there. Emmanuele Busnelli nowhere near the apex of yeah, Bose. He took a big bit of curve, but I think that just, just spat him off wide. Easily done. You only have to get a uh, senior corner very slightly wrong, and then that really puts you out of rhythm into the double droite. And has lost another place to the charging Jens Muller. Yes. And Jens Muller is catching Gina Forgione for second now. Remember, this is the car that has actually already had a drive through penalty 25 minutes later, challenging for second again. Steve Parro about to work his way through and pass Busnelli. Should be a relatively easy job. Parro actually still hasn't made any ground on a lot of these, well, all of these GT3 cars because he's a lap down, remember? Yeah. So you have to overtake them on two separate occasions and then attempt to eat into the, G, to the LMP3 traffic. Yeah. He's got a minute and a half to pick up on the, the last uh, runner in GT. That at the moment is the third of the GMB Honda's the non-related Pedersons. So, bookending the whole race, Rinaldi Racing currently, with this car, the WTM racing machine from Rinaldi and Steve Parro, sadly. Whether that was a mistake in the pits, miscommunication, it meant that that car was late leaving and uh, has to start the race a lap down. There is a change of position within GT3, though, for second spot, because the 44 car recovering from its uh, drive-through penalty. Jens Moller is now ahead of Gino Forgione for AF Corsa. And uh, try and get you a real-time gap between Christian Paulson and Moller. It is 14 seconds. Yeah, just that's about. coming down as well. Jens Moller is not messing about here. He's hustling that car. Knows this car well. Has raced, owned and raced uh, Honda NSX GT3s for several seasons. Has had success in other series with them. Raced in the Nations Cup in one of these cars for Denmark, in Valonia, in the good old days. In fact, I apologise, it was the Motorsport Games, not the Nations Cup. But in an NSX, though? NSX. So it's been it's, a couple of years. It's his car. I mean, yeah. he, he has raced an NSX. Uh, oh, trouble there for the Frigadelli racing car. Klaus Abelan. Stays out the barriers. Did he? I think he did. Yeah, OK. Uh, they're further back than I thought, and he's brought quite a bit of dust on the road with him, but crucially the rear bullets that sit behind the rear wheels appear to be intact. Oh, they round did a great job avoiding that, didn't once they? Once and then backwards and got perilously close to the plastic barriers, which I think are right in front of the harder Armco barrier right behind, but he avoided both. And yes, the avoidance of two cars behind him was uh, like a, a cat on a hot tin roof. Yep. Out of turn five and through six and seven will go the 32 of Daniel Schneider. And he has just ahead of him the MV2S Forestier racing car of Christoph Kress. So that sort of retains the livery that MV2S ran with last year Correct. without the Forestier backing. And then you've got the green and white car. We haven't caught a glimpse of too much, actually, but it's doing very well. We three. rest assured of that. Jerome de Sadelier running second. We are just three seconds off the lead at the moment and hand, uh, fending off Alexander Machel in the racing spirit along the Maten car by 2.3 seconds right now. So, some hard running going on here. Through Senior into Bose, the fight for 18th position. 
is the one we're witnessing. Christian, uh, sorry, Christoph Cresp and Daniel Schneider. Jonathan Brossar about five seconds away from this. And are these two likely to catch anybody in the near future? Well, Alexander Talkinitsa has got a bit of a stride on, actually, and is running in 17th place in the number nine car. Freddie Hunt still trying to recover for Reiter, and he's running in ninth place behind Louis Saint-Jouin for Graf Racing, just heading out of turn two now, and a fair bit of kerb there for Mo Smith in number 69. Yeah, Racing Spirit of Le Mans team manager for the car 43, running 16th lands of Jacques Wolf. The team manager there is being uh, asked to go immediately to race control. Not usually good news. Tends not to be. No. They don't uh, generally want a cup of tea and a biscuit. No, it's not it's kind of... I've seen something on today you'd be quite interested in. It's <laughs> normally more meaningful than that. More to the point. Yes. Graf Racing, CD Sport are absolutely nose to tail for fifth and sixth. So Fabrice Rossello and Fabian Michal are... Well, Michal looking the more racy. He's doing the chasing. Rossello, new to the championship and, uh, well, has taken to it pretty well, but cannot hold back Michal out of senior corner. And the 37 is now ahead of car 57. CD Sport coming through, the 37 car. We've got cherry red and yellow colours, stand out in any field. Moves ahead of the 57 car. Rossello, who competed in the Asian Le Mans series, did he do all four races with G-Drive? They were two separate weekends, so yes, it was very easy for him to do that in yeah. a JSP 320 once again. That was a graph run car, and it was a topsy-turvy season in Asia for the LMP3 field. So it was graph with G-Drive, was yes, it? Yes, it was. OK, yeah. so uh, a bit of uh, branding on top of uh, the French squad but prior to that he hadn't raced for six years wow. so uh, a welcome back to motorsport for fabrice rossello of france 69 car here part of a rejuvenated cool racing effort in 10th position with mo smith not seen mo this weekend i don't know whether or not uh, the beardage is still Oh, I would imagine it's still very much uh, there. And, uh, of course, no longer covered up by a mask, yeah. which was a peculiar well, say covered up by it would be a big mask. True. <laughs> it did rather protrude, left, right, <laughs> bottom, top. You could always tell it was Mo on the way. Yeah, and uh, Mo will be part of the LMP3 pole-sitting effort in the European Horn Series, together with Mikey Benham and Malte Jakobsen. Good dicing between Jonathan Brossar and Sean Lynn right now. So Brossar competing for 20th place mm -hmm. in the ANS motorsport machine. So ANS uh, team we did see last season. They started the season Barcelona, I think, last year in a Adès chassis. Uh, and then uh, we didn't see them again. There's this car, we get a chance to see that car up close all over carbon finish but with a really quite beautiful oh, oh that was that was well how can i put this gently <laughs> i'm waiting <laughs> i'm waiting edgy <laughs> it, it was one of those moments where the vice was closing you know that little keyhole that you're aiming for was almost not there for Freddie Hunt and others involved. It was one of the three GMB Motorsports uh, Hondas involved as well. He's, he doesn't but, like any of his dad's drive, does he? No, no, certainly not, no. So was that Louis Sanjouin for Graf that uh, he was trying to pass Quite at the time? Because Freddie Hunt uh, is sandwiched between Sanjouin and the, Fred, uh, the uh, Mo Smith car. Two Nielsen carts together, seven and the four. It will be Tony Wells, John Melson. Tony Wells, of course, with Colin Noble, the defending champions here. And you'll notice 
uh, eagle-eyed viewers that one is Duquesne, i.e. the form, one yep. is Eligier, the seven. So is that down to personal preference? It is indeed. As far as the drivers are concerned? It's down to personal preference, I think, about the car owner, uh, is what it comes down to. And it's it's got to the stage where, you know, just a, two or three years ago, it wasn't unusual to see him mixed. Well, no, well, M Racing did it for a few years. It is. And I don't think that was down, that was driven necessarily by drivers and who owned cars. It was more of a question of we don't know which is better, yeah. so we'll have one of each. But in the case of Nielsen, it is a decision dictated by their customers, effectively. I believe so, yeah. And the cars that were already in their possession. Um, but it's useful data, I would imagine, from a Nielsen point it can't of view. Because then if you're attracting uh, future customers, you say, well, we've run both. So it's up to you. And indeed, they have before. So they yeah. have run, uh, they, we had seasons where they ran just Ligiers, and we had seasons when they've run just Normas slash Duquesnes. Thorsten Kratz pulling away a little now, four seconds to the good, but Alexander Mitchell still hanging on in there with Jerome de Savalier. This is pretty close stuff. They are pulling away, though, from Charlie Cruz. Fabien Michel just a little way back as well. Klaus Abelin's off the road again. Time. That was at senior corner. You never have a small incident at the end of the Mistral straight. He nearly took somebody with him as well. Was there contact? Tricky to tell from that no, angle. I don't think so. Well, it certainly wasn't afterwards. It was, it was at 22 that I saw going through shot. And well, that's a United Order sports car, so it's not the right livery for that, unless Latour has a slightly. Uh, I don't know, it is a United Order sports is, car. But that's it's got the Rivier Coffee livery car. Gotcha. So they've got that three traditionally liveried cars, and then the All Australian crew car, which is in a completely different. Andras uh, Latour, who uh, did some good avoidance driving there as well. We'll see Garnet Patterson in that car later, the Adelaidean. Freddie Hunt going out of the left-hander at turn seven and on to the Mistral straight. Car 76 there for Reiter has still not got ahead of Louis Saint-Jouin. Maurice Smith pursuing behind. It's closer, actually, from an attacking point of view for Mo Smith than it is for Freddie Hunt catching up with uh, the Graf Racing Swiss-driven 40 car. They reach the top of the hill. You can have the top of the hill here at this relatively flat circuit, but there is some gradient change. It's not uh, nothing in comparison to Spa, for example, or Red Bull Ring, where we've been in the past, but a little bit up and down nevertheless. And the track walk slash cycle event that happened on Thursday will have been helpful for that, as out of Virage Dupont will go the scrapping Jerome de Sadelier. Now, as I said, Matt, not seen a great deal of the green and white car from MV2S, but he's running in second place, and that gap's coming down now to Alexander Matchell in third, or Matchell closing the gap to the Swiss. Yep, that, uh, that gap under a second for the first time in just uh, quite a few laps now. We are 37 minutes into this one hour, 50 minute encounter, and 14 laps under the wheels of the leading cars. Emanuele Busnelli snaking his way through the Virage du L'Hôtel and Virage du Camp at turn five in the day glow yellow and blue Ebi Motors Porsche. So Ebi Motors running fourth in GT3 behind the two or two of the GMB Motorsport Honda NSXs, Christian Paulson and Jens Muller, and then it is Gino Forgione in the AF Corsa Ferrari number 61 that he is sharing with Andrea Montemini. Yes, that Andrea Montemini. Yes, quite. The one time, in fact, more than one time, Formula One driver. So Andrea last year for several races. I don't think it was quite a full season. And running very wide is one of the Hondas. I think that's the 44. class leader, isn't it? It's the 44. A second place, therefore. Yes, with the yellow door mirrors and skirts. So it's Christian Paulson who continues to lead in 55, 44, Jens Moller second, Forgione in the 61 Ferrari is third. Is that Forgione in fact coming into the final corner and being lapped by the second and third placed cars? It's either the 61 or the 51. Yeah, that is. It's Forgione yeah. running in third place in GT3 and overtaken by the Sadelier and Matt Schultz who have half a second between them. Yeah. So 61 pushing on. That's 10 seconds, by the way, ahead of Fimam Willy Busnelli's Porsche at the moment. But this pair, not 
quite tussling yet, but you tend to think that's coming. This is a problem out... Uh, oh, dear me, that's the ANS car. Now, that's gone a long way the wrong way. At turn six. Uh, Ooh, the safe side of the... Of the yes, it was. It was the safe side of the kerbing, but that's the last thing you want if you're heading it out of turn five to see headlights in your direction. So that might be looked at again. Car six is Jonathan Brossard, who obviously had a spin at six yeah. and then was wanting to recover. Quite a bit of weaving now from Hugo de Sadelier. Is he feeling the pressure from Alexander Maxwell? In the braking area, you're generally only allowed one move, one change of direction, but he's trying to break that toe down the Mistral straight, feeling under pressure here, the Swiss. Jerome. Did I say Hugo? Yeah. I'm going to make that mistake several times this season. <laughs> I warn you, Jerome de Sadelier, with all of his experience from the UK in radicals and, and further afield as well in Europe, I mean, I assume he's raced here before in radical competition. So at least he will know the track. But uh, these closed cockpit prototypes um, will have taken some adjusting. And Jerome de Sadelier then not yet been overtaken by Alexander Maxwell. Maxwell's getting closer. Under half a second now. And he's almost under the rear wing of Jerome de Sadelier as they head out of the final corner and back across the stripe. An hour and 20 minutes to go. And the gap is still half a second, second to third. This is playing nicely into the hands of WTM Racing, though. Torsten Kratz, brilliant performance earlier for qualifying, but retains the race lead. He's not getting away. It's still 4.2 seconds. That, so this, whatever this fight is, it's not holding them up. They've still got him very, very much in sight. So whatever's going on with this pair, they've not broken the toe to uh, Torsten Kratz, the WTM car. It's not what we'd normally see with a, with a fight like this, that it allows the leading car to just edge away at a half a second lap. That's not happened at all. There is the leading car. There are the second and third place cars. More warning flags for drivers that are abusing the track limits. Crichton Lentudis is the latest to be added to that. This Mark Crader a little bit earlier on. We've got one that's a pink banner and one that's an orange banner on our timing screen. I don't think there's a difference, actually. No, that one's not more serious than the other. They are just warnings, warnings. at this yeah. stage. As uh, 22nd place, dicing between Team Virage and United Autosports. So Rob Hodes, John Showerman. Showerman's pace should be, uh, or representative pace, should be this car higher up the order. But remember that dramatic spin at turn one has rather forced him to be scrapping just outside the top 20. Full course yellow is going to be coming, and that will happen in about 30 seconds' time. What's Not that sure. going to be for then? Debris? Not, what might well be debris. I uh, would say, by the way, the other change we've seen is just uh, it's, a, it's an inconsequential position in class. It's for the number 27 uh, LMP3 car in 30th place overall now for the 24-7 motorsport car, Andrew Ferguson. But in getting by the GT3 leader, that has delayed Christian Poulsen and the gap now down to 10 seconds between the 55 and 44. Into the full course yellow we will go. And the reason for this is not immediately obvious because we have no cars stopped on the circuit. So maybe some areas need to be swept. We had quite a lot of spins so far and potentially cars uh, bringing, well, floppies onto the track, marker posts, or maybe just a bit of dirt here and there. But uh, a full course yellow after just over half an hour of running. It's been run, a, it feels like a relentless pace, breakneck speed. Marshals are out on track at Virage de l'Hotel to, I'm guessing it's going to be to recover something that's been drawn out of its mountings. It's uh, bollard. There we go. So that is at turn five. And rather than slot it back into position, no, they're just going to scratch that. That's going to be put in the dead bollard park, <laughs> which I'm sure is extensive here. Yeah, so moved out of the way just to make sure that it isn't collected and uh, although they weigh a fair bit, it doesn't take much for a car to hit it, ping it up into the air, and then who knows where it's going to land. So much better to retrieve that. And that will take some racing minutes away from those in the cars at this stage. 
but uh, nothing too dramatic. Still, the lion's share of the cars in the top ten are Ligiers, but it's the Duquesne of WTM Racing that stays out front. Time now is 11 and a half seconds, but that's extended significantly because we're under a uh, full course yellow run to 80 kilometers per hour. Everybody limited to that speed. And with so plenty of cars on the uh, Mistral straight, including the race leader number 11 being driven by Torsten Kratz. He did the qualifying time earlier on, but let's catch up with his teammate Leo Weiss now with Haley. I'm joined here by Leonard Weiss, driver of car number 11 of WTM Racing. We didn't get, didn't get to chat earlier um, after the pole because you ran off to congratulate Torsten. Uh, great, obviously, start the season with the pole. Um, what are your thoughts on the race so far? Yeah, it's pretty good. Tarsten's doing a great job in, in the lead, doing a good race so far. And uh, yeah, let's see if we can, can continue like that and finish the race. That would be awesome. And you obviously raced here last year together. You also do Prototype Cup Germany. I mean, what do you think? Are you, what, what makes you such a kind of a, a good team together? Why, is it, why does it work between you guys? Yeah, I think we work really good together. Like also outside the track, we are good friends. They have nice evenings and uh, yeah I think Thorsten is also a very competitive guy uh, yeah so uh, it's really fun with him and just a word on the field I mean they've got 38 cars out there uh, what are your thoughts on it this year yeah, I think the, the field this year is a lot more competitive than last year especially with a lot of gold drivers this year compared to last year uh, yeah so it's gonna be tough uh, we're off to a good start but let's see what what we can make out of this and it'll be up to you to finish the job yeah i will try my best <laughs> we will see <laughs> great thank you very much Lennon. thank you that's leo vice with Haley edmonds did have a one-off appearance in the european le mans series last year at the red bull ring when he raced with laurence hoor as part of dkr engineering's lineup uh, but that didn't go any further that relationship with dkr but uh, it it was more of a guesting from yep. WTM because Leo and his family, Vice, Georg Vice, his dad, basically WTM as far as I know, they hail, the family hail from Monschau and it's Wockenspiegel team Monschau that are effectively the, the sponsorship name for that Rinaldi racing run car. Absolutely. News, by the way, before she went on air with that interview from Haley, there was an ECU problem that caused the late addition to the race for Rinaldi racing. So clearly they've managed to plug something in, maybe a new ECU. Um, uh, Steve Parrott, by the way, is still in 38th position. I think before we went to this full course yellow, we'd reduced the gap to the 37th place car to something about 30 to 40 seconds. So, an indication shortly, I'm sure, to all the drivers about how much longer it's going to be before we get going. Oh, we've had that. Yep, it's 17... going to be 20 seconds. Not very long at all. Guess therefore. what we're going to hear in about 10 seconds. <laughs> Here it comes. 15 seconds to remove full course yellow. He just did that to make me wrong. Yeah, he's clearly Nine, listening, Eduardo eight, Freitas. Seven, six, five. He tells me he doesn't four, listen to us. Three. We two, put him in the majority, one, in fairness. Full course yellow removed. <laughs> I was told he wouldn't be able to do this race directory without us, to be honest, because we're pointing he, stuff out that he hadn't already spotted. He, he did tell me that uh, in his busy schedule, he sleeps nights better knowing that you and I are here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the truth. In fairness, I think he means that you and I are here rather than in race control. <laughs> Bothering him, prodding him from behind, yeah, yeah. I can understand that. Jerome de Sardelier, not the race leader, but he is in second, and crucially, he's ahead of Alexander Maxwell, remaining the case at the restart. So underneath the Circuit Paul Ricard bridge, they will go. And oh, is there a bit of a forlorn look down at racing spirit of Le Mans, almost as if they'd had a message from race control? Not quite sure. Uh, we'll monitor that as uh, the two cars, DKR and racing spirit of Le Mans, are together on track. DKR Engineering are, or have been many times, the defending champions. Not the case in 2022. Nielsen Racing took the championship uh, in 2021. That's Tony Wells and Colin Noble. Always surprises me as we've got uh, one of the racing spirit of Le Mans cars going by one of the DKR cars. 
how gaps continue to tumble during full course yellow periods. 2.7 seconds is the lead gap now. It's over four seconds before. Notably, Jens Moller was 10 seconds back from Christian Poulsen and is now 2.6 seconds back. Yeah, there's 29 thousandths of a second. No, there's not even that because there's a change of position. Alexander Matchell on the main straight has got ahead of Jerome de Sadelier while well, he was right on his gearbox as they crossed the line and probably along, partly alongside. And Matchell wasn't going to be asked twice there in the run into turn one. Maybe just a better run out of the full course yellow. Jerome de Sadelier relatively inexperienced about restarts, whereas Matchell's done many in this championship, so perhaps that was telling as Freddie Hunt's been overtaken no, that's by... Not that's the optimal car. Ah, OK, so the 20 car's been overtaken of Mark Crader by a United Order Sports car, it's which I wasn't able to Sean, Lynn. Sean Lynn, thank you. Ten seconds added. Oh, there's trouble there. That's a replay. It was a spin. It was a spin for... Didn't see that whether or not there was contact before it, but the MV2S car spun. Can't have been much of a spin and because he was here. still right with him at Turn 1. And a slow car now running down towards Turn 1 as well. That's a puncture, I think. It is a puncture. Rear right, which has taken the bullet with it as well, and way, way off the road at senior corner a few Ooh. moments ago. It's a Virage car. And that's 33. number 33, which is hastily that's Rob rejoining. Rhodes in 23rd place. So all of a sudden, it's all gone wild and crazy. Now, is that the tyre or is that the rear bodywork? It's the rear bodywork off as well, the 44 car. Yeah, yes, smaller from second in GT3, and so far he's held on to second place. But he sp spun right behind Jerome de Sadelier, who's recently slipped to third position at the Double Droit de Bose. That's not. That's going to be costly. It's a very fast part of the circuit to be going off the road as well. What? Well, that's what caused the problem for the number 40 car. That was a tag from the 14 which is Alexander Bukansov, and Bukansov's caught the rear right, which has dislodged, dislodged the bullet at the very least. So Jacques Wolf having to limp his car around the remaining part of the lap. Has it taken the tyre down with it? He'd done amazingly well if it hasn't, but the problem is that the uh, uh, cheese wedge-shaped piece of bodywork that sits behind the rear tyre is flapping around, and the team will need to secure that and it's because that's an integral part. It's no, it's not. As we've learned through the years, it's absolutely. Yeah, so cable ties do not solve that. That cost Jens Muller, by the way, something like 15, 16 seconds. So what happened two or three seconds is back up to 20 seconds now. But it's a mark of the pace of those two Hondas at the front of this field. He's still a further 20 seconds ahead of the third-place car. The other DKR engineering car heading into Bose as well. So that is John Brownson, car number three, running in 23rd spot. Jack Wolf being shown as stopped on the race circuit as Jerome de Sadelier is not at the right line at all for senior corner. I thought that was going to be a much bigger moment than it turned out to be, but he was over on the right-hand side oh. in the dust. I think just behind there was what looked to be a almost an incident between the Edex Sport car and the, and the Honda. So it's de Sadelier trying to get back ahead of Matt Schull, and it didn't quite work, but he got a really good toe. It was just after that, it looked to be very close. Charlie Cruz trying to follow through and take some advantage here, almost coming together with the Honda behind him. And it's so gone crazy at the moment. <laughs> this is a bit more like a Michelin Le Mans car race. Yeah, well, it was relatively sedate in the early phase, before the track was uh, needing to be addressed or swept and the ball on to be recovered. De Sadelier has got way more pace now than Alexander Matchell. What is going on here? Well, it's uh, perhaps just the draft that uh, each car is picking up, because that hole in the air seems to be working so, so well for whichever car is doing the chasing. No way through at Turn 1, though, for the Swiss. But Alexander Matchell must have been thinking, well, I was catching you in the early part of this stint, no problem. Got the move done, thinking I'll be able to stretch my legs and pull away. Just not happened. Yep. I, I never got the feeling Jerome de Sadelier was going to take that line down somehow, and uh, so it has proven. Emanuele Busnelli, meanwhile, for Ebi Motors in the day glow yellow and blue Porsche GT3R in amongst company because the bullet racing Aston Martin of Stephen Patrick is right with him and cars him. facing the wrong way at 13 as well. OK, so he's, he's caught him. It's a much quicker lap last time around from the... 
that was the 43 car, I reckon, that was facing the wrong way. That's, car 43 that, is the racing. Oh, Jack that, Wolf. That's the problem. The so problem he's had a, a further spin and is now on the inside of turn 13. Which is not where he needs to be to through get to the pits. No, no, it's not. You're trying to get to the pits. They're the other side of the track. You've got to wonder how long. Is it safe for him to get across the track? Could we be looking at another caution? Well, the problem is I think he's going to have to go slightly against the flow of traffic and cross the track. So uh, that, that will need a full course yellow, in my opinion, but we'll I wait think and see. Be right. No further action uh, for the contact between cars six and nine. And that was the NS Motorsport car and the AT Racing car. Jack Wolf still stopped at turn 13. As far as we can tell, two Team Virage cars cross the line as one. And they are together on the screen as well. So Rob Hodes ahead of Alexandre Yvonne. I think he might have made pit lane slowly. But oh, I think you're right. He, I yes. think he might have made it. Oh, well, fair play to Jacques Wolf, who had a good view, I suppose, through the right hand, uh, yeah, the right side window. So his side, of work when he sits on the car, of uh, there we go, the gaps in the traffic. Yeah, yeah, I can confirm he's definitely in pit lane. So Racing Spirit of Le Mans, their crew will be able to now work on fixing that car. Very, very busy down at Virage du Comte and it has ripped that tyre to pieces. Now, whether that tyre was down initially, who knows? It's got on the inside wall, the inside shoulder, and that was the contact from the DKR engineering machine at Virage Dupont, and he had to do a full lap with the bullet falling off the car and the tyre letting an awful lot of air out of it. I can explain why the B Motors car had uh, that slow lap. It was contact with the leader. Uh, it's the overall leader for uh, Manuele Busnelli. Car 31, meanwhile, has been reported to the stewards for abusing track limits. And that is this early in the season, trying to remember who's who. That is the AF Corsa Quattelandudis uh, car. And, yeah. So the picture on the right-hand side is Racing Spirit of Le Mans offering a new bullet to the car. Meanwhile, on the left of your picture, the fight between Matchell and de Sadelier continues on. The green and white car not as close now I think to the second-place machine. There's someone else off in the background in that shot. Uh, Stephen Patrick's pitted, by the way, in the black Aston was, Martin. Was that the 24-7 car or quite a Lendudis? It well, looks like the Lendudis uh, livery, but not fully sure. Charlie Cruz is fancying, it? fancying his chances here. He's closer than they'd like, with the CD Sport car also in contention here. We've got five cars within five seconds for the lead of this race. There is a mandatory pit stop to do, remember, in this race. Three cars into one. Kind of did work, actually, at Virage du Hotel, but it looked like it wouldn't for a long period of time. But there are cars starting to pit now, is the point, both in GT3 and LMP3. So reaching a point now where some fuel can be taken on board and uh, driver changes to happen as well. All of the cars entered with two drivers and needing to do that switch around. Yep, Martin Rich on pit lane for RLRM Sport. John Melson will hand over to Matt Bell. Both the Team Virage cars on pit lane as well. Car 33 is reported to the stewards for abusing track limits. I think I've already said that. No, no, I've not. That's another one. So we've got penalties coming at some point. They nope. won't be being served by the drivers that incurred them. It's Rob Hodes in one of the two Virage cars that have found one another. They did that a couple of laps ago. I've been running nose to tail ever since then. Ian Rodriguez to take over the Rob Hodes car, and probably one of the first jobs he'll need to do in his stint is serve that penalty. Alexander Matchell, by the way, has broken the toe from uh, Jerome de Sadler, is now right with Torsten Kratz. I wonder if, with that contact, did the leader suffer some damage? Because that uh, gap that was four seconds is under a second now. Here it is, and it has got smoke trailing from the number 11 car. Yeah. Was that just a bit of a brake grab, or has he lost a bit of pace here? Well, the last lap around was a 154.5. We have seen better than that for the race leader. 0.388 of a second now between Matchell and Kratz. It's something vibrating at higher speed on that car. 
I can't see any smoke I mean, He might just put a brake grab into the final turn, but yeah. he's lost something like three and a half seconds. So Leo Weiss, who we were hearing from with Hayley Edmonds not too long ago, now fully focused with the helmet and hands device on, ready to take over this car from Torsten Kratz, the man from Wuppertal, and Alexander Maxwell. So two Germans at the sharp end, one for Wockenspiegel team Monschau Racing, the other for Racing Spirit of Le Mans, and Maxwell having had to really weather the storm up against Jerome de Sadelier, has now left the Swiss in his wheel tracks. He's still visible on the Mistral stage, straight in the mirrors, but he'll be fully locked on on this leading Duquesne from WTM. Under five seconds, between the top five. And some of that damage has been... Flat, that's top, yes, top five, 4.9 seconds is yeah, the gap. A larger gap back to Fabrice Rossello. Fabian Michel will be one to look out for because his car's clearly set up to go well down the Lindois de Mistral because he's just done the fastest middle sector of anybody in the CD Sport car, 37. Freddie Hunt out of the right engineering car. After a spirited stint aboard the 76, Steve Paro pits the number 66 car. Did not make it by any of the other uh, traffic, but closed the gap to just about nothing in his stint from a lap back. Car 31 being told it must respect the track limits as the A, of course, a car of Lenten, then do this again. And it's potentially going to be a mass of penalties if if those uh, track limits are abused by a few cars now that are kind of on a, a yellow plus card, if you like. And the next step would be a drive-through penalty. We're under an hour to the end of this race. Of course, that's not the halfway point anymore. An hour and 50 minutes for 2022. And quite a large section of the middle order now coming into the pit. Well, they've become the middle order because they've made a pit stop. And one of two Graf racing cars in, so Fabrice Rossello happy to stay out. But the team, uh, the French Graf squad, have told Louis Saint-Jouin they want him in now. Car 40 for Swiss driver Saint-Jouin, and it'll be Théo Vaucher to take over that car. It's uh, going to be drive-through penalties for both car 31, that is the AF Corsa car, Rui Aguash will be aboard that car, if not already, then shortly, and also the car 33 mentioned earlier that's the car that's just been taken over by Ian Rodriguez guess from uh, Rob Hodge wasn't it yes uh, the the problems for track limits for Crichton Lent 2 this have got worse because he's now been given a drive-through penalty in car 31 so that will delay and remember you can't do a drive-through penalty at the same time as your no. pits your schedule pit stop with the driver change of fueling so it's effectively going to cost about 30 seconds for a drive-through here yeah still the gap first to second is next to nothing jerome de saddle is going to bolt his way onto the back of this as well so it'll be a three-way dice all catching quite a bit of curve on the exit of virage dupont there is uh, one of the two af course of ferraris just in front to get by and Torsten Kratz should be able to do that with very, relatively little time lost but Matchell wants to do the same and he can't because the Ferrari's got to turn in at some point and takes to the natural apex and, and here it. comes Santa Sadelier who spots that all unfolding in front of him the patience game for the Swiss the man from Lausanne will He's take second it. place back again absolutely brilliant stuff from de Sadelier Waited, 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 waited for the opportunity of the mistake. The mistake came. It wasn't much, probably cost him a tenth or two. Bottled up behind the Ferrari, that was all he needed. But more to the point, left the gap on the inside. And like a rat on a chip. Not in any way saying, of course, you're only anywhere like, uh, like a rodent. Not that would be wrong and unfair. But like a rat on a chip goes through into second place and watch the two cars behind here as well Charles Cruz has not been dropped at any point by this group again De Sadalier having the need to weave from left to right but he can't get the car again. over to the right hand side to defend into senior corner and Matchell 
getting the toe, as we've seen a number of times, and look at the fourth place car also getting involved as well. Charles Cruz, who was way back, what, five, ten minutes ago for Edex Sport, being drawn into this. Unfortunately for this trio, they've rather kissed goodbye to Torsten Kratz now. Is that a bit of smoke coming out the back of Cruz's car as well? Maybe just dust, actually, as he picked it up offline. CD Sport in the mixture as well. Fabian Michal been setting absolute best, as did Cruz, actually, on the last lap around. Middle sector again. So we know now that the Cruz Edex Sport car is good down the Mistral. Likewise, Fabian Michal, and this is all coming to a head. We are in the pit stop window, but none of these are taking to it, apart from Matchell. Alexander Matchell does stop. And that might not be a bad move, actually, to get out of the craziness, the manic area of this race. Well, Charlie Cruz being this close to Savalier, and with the speed we know he's got down the main straights, this could be another telltale move. A telling move at this stage of the race. 55 minutes to go. We are now at halfway, or we will be in about 30 seconds. Uh, tries to run the outside. There's no way there on the inside. He's going to be looking to get as close as he can with the pick that is the slower LMP3 car ahead here. To suddenly his tyres have gone, I think, because he can't... He, he not meeting the apex of any of those corners. Three, four, five, the car looking all of a sudden very wayward, whether that's a slow puncture or it's just he's pushed his tyres incredibly hard, but he will lose out, I think, to... Charlie, Charles Cruz, no, not quite. It's coming, though, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, meantime, GT3 leader on pit lane from the GMP Motorsport crew. That puts, Jan, uh, that puts Jens Muller back into the lead for the moment, at least. Didn't manage to get it done there, but that's brought the CD Sport car into it. Here comes Fabian Michal. That was a back marker they were getting by, by the way. This is great stuff. It is truly exciting, enthralling action in the opening round oh, of the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Very there. sideways there for CR Cruz. And that might be Michel's opportunity as they head into Gomb uh, Bondor corner. And Galaban is next, this long, lingering right-hander. Then the hard stop at Virage du Lac, and Michel gains ground under braking there. But there is no way by Cruz in the last couple of corners of this particular lap. Quick laps coming, by the way, from some of the pro drivers come clubbing aboard the cars. Fastest lap of the race goes to the car at the moment in ninth place. It's RRM Sports 53 car, now in the hands of Tommy Foster, a 151.573 with yellow flags at turn six. Torsten Kratz, 2.4 seconds in front of Jerome de Sadelier. So Kratz, I think, has been delayed through some traffic and a four-second gap is steadily coming down once again. It's going to be a drive-through, by the way, for the number 14 D-car engineering car. That was the Duquesne. That was the clash a little earlier with car 43. That's... AT Racing Team just in front of Jerome de Sadelier with Alexander Talcan. It's a senior driving that. Has there been a driver change? Oh, trouble in the there. That's one there the, it's one of the cool racing cars. It's Malta Jakobsen having 69. just come out. It is. Yes, it is. Malta Jakobsen's just taken that car over from Morris Smith, and the car grinds to a halt at turn side five. Side by side. Side by side with Charles Cruz and Jerome de Sadelier. Can't, Can't get it done make again. It stick, there was no cruise wasn't well, quite there. It was that was the AT that racing the, car. Yeah, the AT car that they're trying to get by. And what I was trying to work out is whether the AT racing car's been into the pits and done their driver change. Yes, it is Alexander Talkin. It's a junior now taking over from Dad. So it is the top six cars overall are the only cars that have not been down pit lane as we stand at the moment. MV2S Forestier Racing lead the race with the pit stop. Underway, no, w, sorry, W10 Racing has got a bit of a problem with the timing scoring as well, shown as being stopped, which they aren't. So a transponder issue there, I think. So Torsten Kratz is in the pits, that's what's gone on. Now Jerome de Sadler leads and goes through for another lap. Kratz is in, Charlie Cruz is in, Fabian Michel is in. Sh Sean Lynn pits, hand over to his son. So Jerome de Savalier will get a bit of blissful release from the unending pressure over the last, what is it, hour and, well, it's just over an hour, just under an hour, rather. 
He's now in clear air for the first time in 60 minutes and will be in, I'm sure, very soon. Yeah, but what he can't afford to do, now it's all gone quiet in front and behind, is to dip the pace because you just know once he does his pit stop and uh, everything is back on an even keel, he'll have traffic all around him and potentially in front of him as well if uh, the crews of CD Sport and Edex Sport can get their pit stops to near perfection. They stand the chance, a strong chance, of leapfrogging MV2S Forestier Racing with number 29. And remember, these are timed pit stops for these teams. A single time pit stop for this year. So all very chilled down at WTM Racing because it's less haste, more speed. That front right wheel was very casually placed on the hub, but uh, done up in great time. And actually, everything has been completed well in front of time. So they're just now waiting for the clock to tick down, as is the case with CD Sport. I'm going to make a prediction that the second place car at the moment in GT3 will not stay there for the rest of the, the, the uh, race. Bullet Racing up to second place with Teo Nui uh, up in, in, uh, now aboard the number 99 car. But their pit stop, 30 seconds quicker than anybody else's. In has come Jerome de Sandalia, who overtakes the 11 car briefly in the pit lane, but that's because the space within MV2S is much further down. In fact, it might be after the break in the pit building and in the second part of the pit lane, therefore. Away from the Rinaldi Racing stand will go the WTM racing car of... Now Leo Weiss, who's taken over from Torsten Kratz. Jerome de Sadelier will be leaping out after a very entertaining stint for him as well. And Louis Rousset will take that car over. Just waiting for Sean Lenzer pit now. I think it's the final pit stop. I must admit, I thought I'd seen him there. In, out comes Leo Weiss. Wait to see how this all pans out. So Louis Rousset, who will be the new man into the 29 car, just 23 years old after a single season of FFSA GT4 racing in France at AM level. Rousset uh, being the silver-rated driver to take charge of car 29. I think this is Leo Weiss with Tom Dillman right behind him for position. It is. That's the 10 car on the 11 car. This is for position with the two cars ahead of them now on pit road. So this is effectively the battle for the lead. WTM, Racing Spirit Le Mans. Tom Dillman goes to the inside. Barreling their way down the Mistral straight and He's Leo Weiss this. hasn't covered this line into He's senior corner. Can he continue this pace? No chance around the outside. So Tom Dillman, rather, has caught Leo Weiss napping there. And the Duquesne that has led virtually every lap to this point all of a sudden gives up, relinquishes its grasp at the sharp end. Now, that's not going to be displayed on the screen for a little while yet because Sean Lynn, who was one of the late pit stoppers, and Jerome de Sadelier shown in front of both of those cars. But this should unfold if not for the race lead, then incredibly close to it as the clock continues to tick down for Louis Rousset, who will be taking the 29 car back into the race. Surely it's going to move very, very soon indeed. Remember, Ooh. the pit stops are timed from pit in to pit out, so the team need to be so, so careful not to bring... Here he comes, coming out of pit lane, and he will be ahead of the number 11 car of uh, Leo Weiss. Will he be ahead of Tom Dillman? Yes, he is. Yes, just, just... But Dillman's going to be all over the back of uh, Louis Rousset. And if he, well, he's going to need to pounce right now as Rousset is still adjusting to the car on his opening lap. Tom Dillman's done a lap after the pit stop and up the inside he will go. This is crucial for racing Spirit of Le Mans. So Tom Dillman passes, makes two crucial passes in under a single lap. Jetting off into the distance somewhat. W10 Racing's the old ice, by the way, now under pressure from, uh, from Dino Lonardi, the EDEX Sport car for third place. Trouble there for the 53 car, Tommy Foster. That car had been sixth position. What happened here? That was a clash with the Frigadelli car. Yeah. 
Tommy Foster also, uh, according to a graphic a few moments ago, had the fastest lap of the race he did. as well. Correct, but that's and been now taken by Lawrence Hur. Hur. Remember so, that guy? Yes, he's down <laughs> in 22nd place, having just climbed aboard the car, but... Uh, yeah, so Lawrence taking over from John Brownson, the second DKR engineering car rather going beneath the radar to this point. What an opening stint for Jerome de Sadelier in ACO Rules Racing. Let's hear from him, from, ha from Haley. I'm joined here by Jérôme de Sadelier, a driver of car number 29. So it was a, a very dramatic, uh, well, dramatic, you know, event, eventful stint for you out there. Can you just take us through it? You know, you managed to, to make up the time after that spin. Uh, when you pitted, you pitted first with the decision, of course, by a team to keep you out a bit longer. Well, yeah, let me start by saying this was my first ever LMP3 race, so a lot of learning quickly about tire degradation, etc. I got a pretty good start, had to defend uh, quite aggressively, actually, because I think the back had a bit of a jump. Um, the Duquesne car that was in front of me had a very good rhythm, but as I suspected when the tires came off, he lost a lot, a lot of pace. Uh, and that with um, me and, and uh, the other Ligier that overtook me, we were able to make up a lot of uh, ground. To, to eventually catch him. Uh, tire degradation on the rear was pretty strong. I had a big spin uh, before uh, the last chicane. And I don't know, I managed to do some drift move and get it straight back on, bang it to second. And, and I was pretty much where I was when, uh, when I did the, the little spin. So kind of uh, proud of myself there. <laughs> Your teammate Louis Rousset has just jumped in the car, uh, currently lying in second place. I mean, what do you think he's going to what, what he's going to have to do to really kind of get that first place? Louis is uh, is a huge talent. Every car he's ever been in, he gets in and he's on the pace. He, so, you know, I think he has the potential if he stays calm and uh, has a very kind of leveled and uh, leveled throttle. He's going to be able to make up some space and maybe overtake. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Jerome de Sadelier, uh, I detected that the car was nowhere towards the end of his stint and the apex at three, four, five, six, and I thought his tyres had sort of gone off a cliff. It's interesting that he says degradation is something he's really going to have to get his mind around, and you'd spotted the spin as well towards yeah. the end of the lap. But I have to say, car control, when you take all that into account, yeah. was mighty. And he's right. Uh, after the spin, he lost nothing. So it was remarkable, really. 69 car of Milton Jakobsen. Sadly, we won't get to see the young day attack this race under tow and that car is out drive through is coming for car six for overtaking car 31 in the first full course yellow that is the ANS Motorsports uh, Ligier Nicolas Schatz at the moment at the wheel of that car in 24th place not all bad for Malta Jakobsen today though did take pole earlier in LMP3 qualifying for the European Le Mans series, so their cool racing car will start from pole tomorrow. Correct. Mikey Benham, Mo Smith as part of that trio as well. So looking forward to Malta getting some uh, some good race time uh, during the four hours of Le Castellet. But you know motor, uh, you know racing drivers, what's his overpowering emotion going to be at the end of the day? Damn! Didn't get the oh, chance yeah. to race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horror. I mean, yeah, you, you, you build all of your day to the to a late afternoon, early evening race, and then on your out lap, it all goes wrong uh, through no fault of your own. Tough to take, but it, it, it's the mark of a good sports person to be able to yep. say, park that, that's today, move on to tomorrow. So full course yellow, that will take us through to the recovery of the number 69 Cool Racing Ligier. Melissa Jakobsen barely getting the chance. To, I don't think he, he got a full racing lap. Out of no. that stint? No. Real shame. And as this full course yellow continues, we've got just under 45 minutes of the race to go, but it's been an enthralling first stint in Writer Engineering's car for Freddie Hunt, so let's hear from him as well. That's right, I'm down here joined by Freddie Hunt, a driver of car number 76 for Rater Engineering. Uh, I saw you when you just dumped out of the car and you, you had a big smile on your face. You were, you know, you're happy to be back after what, more, you, Monza was your last race you were at. Yeah, Monza last year and I'm very happy to be back. I mean, it was, a, it was quite a challenging race, but bloody good fun. <laughs> really enjoyed myself. OK, well, just take us through it. You know, it's not too hard to kind of, you know, so intermittently uh, jump into an LMP3 car and, you know, compete like this. Well, I wouldn't say it's easy, um, and you know, I, I was hoping to be better 
you know, a little bit quicker. You know, qualified sixth, which to me, I mean, it's not bad, but I was hoping to be better. So, although, you know, I can't be too upset about it. I'm, uh, you know, I like to think I should be, should be, should be further up. However, no pre-season testing and, an, and a new team are new to the car. So we're all, we're all learning. Um, I think it is quite a tricky circuit if you haven't been here before. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too, too disappointed with our, with our performance. And um, you know, towards the, in the sort of second half of my stint, um, I, I was quite proud of my driving because the car was was really handling badly, and, and I figured out how to, how, how to how to drive it. My lap times were improving, even though the tyres were getting worse and worse. But my lap times were improving, so I was, so I was quite pleased with that. Well, that's good. It's a good start anyway to your season. We could do, you'll be doing the full championship with us. So thanks a lot, and thank you very much, uh, Freddie. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, so uh, third season, technically speaking, we see him in an LMP3 car because he did the Road to Le Mans in 2019. As Hayley mentions, did the Monza round last year uh, in, was it last year or the year before? No, that was 2021 with Mulner Motorsport. Uh, and he's back again and for the full season. So very exciting. Uh, and you're right, just like his dad. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, well, more power to Writer Engineering. Great to see them and our other additions this season. 31 cars, let's remember, at the start of this race. We've lost just one of them. It's the Cool Racing number 69 car, because back into the race has come the number 43 Racing Spirit Le Mans car with Josh Gelton. And uh, as I say his name, he moves ahead of the stationary Cool Racing car in the order. Tom Dillman leads the race from Lou Rousset, and that gap, two and a half seconds, but it's not gone up. No, stabilised for the moment, and that's to every credit for uh, Louis Rousset. Um, Tom Dillman, I mean, a name we know clearly from World Endurance Championship racing, Formula E as well, but uh, has he ever raced in the Michelin Le Mans Cup? I would think not. Don't think so. No. And ever raced an LMP3 car? Probably I will, I will not. Double check it. He's the sort of calibre of driver that it wouldn't take many laps at all to get his head around how one of these cars behaves and at certain points through the stint. I was very impressed with the fact that he was only on lap two and already having to get his sleeves rolled up to deal with overtakes that were for the race lead and Dillman now should continue this stranglehold on the race lead. He had one race last season for Mulder Motorsport. Oh uh, right, he okay. Did. How easily one forgets these things. Indeed. But um, yeah, racing spirit of Le Mans, presumably his team for the full season. We'll wait and see. But 3.1 seconds uh, is uh, a decent amount of time to be playing with, so he's extended that by another 50%, effectively, two seconds to three, and uh, if he can do that again in the next few laps, that will take some pressure off. Louis Rousset trying to react in the green and white MV2S racing car. Dino Lunardi, fellow Frenchman for EDEC Sport, running in third spot. In GT3, it is a Honda NSX that leads with... Uh, Kasper H. Jensen in that GMB Motorsport car 55, ahead of the bullet racing Aston Martin now, Teo Nue. You yeah. mentioned Teo's name not too long ago. They've been just going about their business quietly and assuredly. I am concerned about that oh, pit stop the, the time. time. Yeah, okay. yeah, I am concerned about that pit stop time. New fastest lap of the race goes to 15th place Wayne Boyd, as we were watching a change on the track for eighth position, Matt Bell dragging by the Writer Engineering uh, number 76 Ligier of Mats Silkhaug and uh, Mats in the Nielsen Racing number 4 car moves up into 8th position, his next target is the 57 Graf Racing car of Ryan Harper Ellum Yeah, so to make the point about the bullet racing Aston Martin, 2 minutes it's pit stop time and everybody else has been over 2.5 minutes Correct. so uh, that's a massive win and probably not a legal one but we will leave the officials to look into that and put at the moment puts bullet racing in a good spot on paper how long will that last second place for the all-black uh, Aston Martin and Gustav Birch now he's the son of team owner at GMB correct and well uh, it was Jens Moller who was singing Gustav's praises earlier on saying he's a really talented silver rated driver car 44 potentially on course for second position here going well being caught by Andrea Montemini 
uh, at the moment, but the rate of just a, about a second and a half a lap or so. We're in that phase of the race, remember, when the star LMP3 drivers are now aboard. We talked about Tom Dillman looking a bit further down. Sean Tong is with us. 31 seconds stop and go penalty for car 99 for not respecting the minimum pit stop time. That's exactly what I was talking about, what seems like 10, 15 minutes ago. And that's a that's a, an error by the first time a team uh, in this series, and that's going to cost them dear. Uh, who else is uh, aboard? Matt Bell is up into eighth place and going uh, well. Colin Noble, defending champion, into the top ten now, Colin, and going quickly with cars ahead of him that are not as quick. Michael Markison going well in the Team Tour car, just outside the top ten and going very well indeed, Team Tour, uh, 11th place. Kai Van Berlo, Wayne Boyd running more or less in formation but 15 seconds apart, 14th and 15th in the two leading United Autosports cars. And then looking down, uh, who we got else? Garnet Patterson, Lawrence Herr, Alex Mortimer, Felipe Laza, all aboard a really Aquash, all aboard the cars at the moment and putting in good lap times. Things can and will change in the next half hour. Casper H. Jensen in the 55 Honda leading the way, but we're focusing on the 88 car, which is in seventh position for Mikkel Pedersen. And that car looking to try and close the gap of nine seconds to Luke Davenport in his AF Corsa Ferrari number 51. So four GT3 cars together on the screen from 29th down to 32nd overall. And the gap of Rinaldi Racing's Daniel Kylevitz, who took over the 66 from Steve Paro before we see three more GT3s. Ebby Motors and Emanuele Busnelli. Now, he came in for a driver's it, stop. He uh, did, so it must be... Uh, just, just yeah, it must, must be a driver ID. It must glitch. be. It's, that should by now be Fabio Babini. Yeah. So they're going to get a drive-through for abuse of track limits. Babini facing 20 seconds before he can get anywhere close to Andrea Montemini. That's not going to come down in no, the I would suggest. It should. <laughs> uh, that uh, drive-through, by the way, is good news for Bullet. They take that uh, drive-through immediately, by the way, the stop and hold. 31 seconds, they will be... Uh, it's going to cost them a minute, isn't it? This, so More like it's it, yeah. 30, 30 seconds-ish on a ratter to get through pit lane as GMB's number 44 car in the hands of Gustav Birch goes through now to make it a 1-2 for the Danish Honda squad. Their third car, by the way, the number 88 in the hands now of Mikkel O. Pedersen. That car is running seventh and last in the class. And Montemini goes up into third place with the Honda stationary. Seventh, did, sorry, the Aston Martin stationary. Apologies, Johnny. Seventh place fight, very close indeed for the Duquesne, run by Nielsen Racing of Colin Noble and Michael Markison, who is in the uh, uh, 57. No, big pardon, it's Ryan Harper Ellen, I should say, in the 57 Graf Racing car. There is the bullet car emerging, and it emerges ahead of the EB Motors. Porsche, which has still got to do a drive-through. So that's relatively good news for the Aston Martin team. Their fourth place now looking reasonably secure. So, yeah, Matt Bell, not Colin Noble, getting my uh, Nielsen cars mixed up there. So Bell ahead of Harper Ellen for seventh and eighth. Yeah, so he's making progress. Tommy Foster is his next target, but at the moment, Tommy, rather quicker. Albeit Matt's just had to deal with the challenge of getting by another car. So Matt Bell is on a bit of a tear right now. Tommy Foster of the cars in the top 10 is the fastest man on the circuit right now. 150.8, which is a new personal best. So that would have been better than his earlier fastest lap had it not been stolen away from him by, who did we say, someone way down the order got the fastest lap to this point. And there's the two DKR cars side by side, and yes. that is Lawrence Herr going through. And that is for position. Goes by James Winslow, Lawrence Herr up into the top 20 now. And Lawrence's name, it was the one I was searching for because yep. he has the fastest lap of the race, and uh, easy to Wayne overlook Boyd. that. Wayne, oh, he's Wayne now, is Wayne it? Boyd. Okay, so he's gone even quicker than that. Wayne Boyd with a 150.691. So Lawrence Herr. Car three ahead of James Winslow now, car 14. That's a place change done on the main straight. And Max Lynn not very far away from, Max, in fact, he's behind them now. No, no, he, he, was, he was rather kind of 
I don't want to say bullied off. It was uh, Lawrence being very firm indeed. Max decided to get out of that uh, sticky situation, run off on the runoff, as, because that's what you do on runoffs, you Generally run off, speaking. Um, and rejoins having lost a couple of positions, yeah. but uh, through and taking another position up to 18th now as Lawrence Hur, and he's taking the second DKR car with him in formation. So what can be won here by Lance Hur is next target, Emilian Cardé in the second of the MV2S first DA racing cars, and that's 7.7 .7 seconds further up the road. Emanuele Busnelli has just come back in the pits for Ebi yeah, Moses. That's his, that's his run through, that's his drive through. Fine, but it, do we still think it's, Bus uh, still think it's Babini? Anyway, yes. answer that in a moment or two, because they may have that to uh, rectify as well. Let's go down into the land of GMB Motorsport, catch up with one of their drivers, speaking to Hayley. I'm down here with a gentleman, a driver of car number 44. He started pole and then ended up getting a penalty for a jump start. Yeah, it's... it's uh mistake from my side the car in front of me he stopped totally so to avoid to hit him in behind I went into the middle and of course I know I have I cannot overtake him before the starting line but yeah it was very difficult I uh, maybe a little bit unfair but end of the day it's the rules Gustav's doing a good job out there he's just gone up to second place Gustav he's done a good job out there he's uh, currently sitting in second place yeah yeah he's it seems now he found the pace. Uh, it's his first race international, so I think uh, I think he just needs to concentrate and show how big talent he is. I think we have a good chance to be on the podium, it looks like, right now. Great, thank you very much. And a significant uh, performance difference for Gustav because he's done all his racing to this point in TCRs, whether that be in his homeland of Denmark or with Brian Madsen Sport in TCR Europe. The Birch family hail from Arns in the centre of Denmark, though. And uh, that, I understand, is where a lot of their um, fast food franchises are based as well. Very similar to Julien Canal, actually, of Le Mans. Uh, and a number of McDonald's uh, joints that... Uh, Julian Canal uh, looks after, owns in the middle of France. Well, it's a similar situation for the Birches in Denmark, hence the reason why the Golden Arches are adorning the three cars brought to this weekend for GMB Motorsport. Still running 1-2, not quite 1-2-3, though, because the 88 car is in sixth position in the hands of Mikkel O. Pedersen. And he, in turn, is now ahead of Luke Davenport. Fabian Babini's name does appear next to the Ebi Motors Porsche now after that uh, penalty that was served by him. And actually, Michelo Pedersen's uh, uh, pace is pretty good at the moment, and that's going to put Fabian Babini under some pressure if, he, if indeed he is still ahead of the third of the Hondas. It's Honda 1 2, then it's Andre Montemini. Teo Nue uh, has uh, emerged in fourth place. In fact, has just, I think, has he just gone by Montemini? I think he has. Yeah, Nue having had to come into the pits in the bullet racing Aston Martin is shown ahead of Montemini now. Now that so could only be Montemini. Yeah, he's had a drama somewhere, I think. Having had, yes, indeed. So we'll keep an eye on Montemini's time. Being shown as stopped, stopped on the circuit. So No, I think that's just re it's recorrected itself. By, it's a timing glitch. OK. So apologies to any Aston Martin fans who've just fallen off the sofa. Yeah, so Montemini is still ahead of Nui and still being shown as stop, so clearly that's not right. It's and Al Kamel having to insert him manually on our timing screen. So the order in GT3 is Casper H. Jensen for GMB Motorsport, 55 on the first from Gustav Birch, also in a GMB Honda 44 second, then Montemini third in the 61 Ferrari, bullet racing's Aston Martin, Teo Nue fourth, and the Evi Motors Fabio Babini driven Porsche in fifth. So this is Nielsen Racing's number four car, the hands of Matt Bell, Matt pushing on, he's got 10 seconds to find, he's got to terms with Tommy Foster, but he's not as quick as Foster. There was a car off the road at turn yeah, seven there, that there was, was a, a prototype. Black and red car, might well have been the ANS car. Maybe, um, if not the 66. Also, a new fastest lap of the race has gone to Lawrence Hurt, a 150.480. Single digit number. It is the ANS? No, it's the 80 racing car. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Number nine car. Car number nine, yeah. 
and find that on the screen to just confirm that with the first sector time. Uh, it's a little bit slow. Anyway, Maybe it's, it uh, it's uh, whichever car it was has rejoined and thankfully didn't delay two minutes. It might have been just into, yes, it is into sector two actually. It's the car. It's the ANS car. Right. Sector two was a long one, yes, for uh, the ANS machine, so that explains it. Yeah. Should have, st should have stuck with my first guess, really, shouldn't I? But, yeah. Tom Dillman still leading and pulling away a little now. 5.9 seconds to the good from Rui Rousset, who is under pressure now from the export car of Dino Lodardi, under a second back from the MV2S 29 car. They're comfortably ahead now of Leo Weiss, with Sean Tong closing in on the WTM racing car in the 37th CD Sport car in fifth. Then we get to the Tommy Foster, Matt Bell contest. Matt, in clear air, is able to just edge closer, but it's over 10 seconds of the gap. And Tommy's still got very good pace. Gone by and pulled away a little from Ryan Harper Ellen, who is going to be coming under pressure pretty soon from Colin Noble, two and a half seconds back. So the reigning champion getting back onto form here and contesting eighth position. Just looking further back here, Michael Markison with good times at the moment, as is Keon Carey, 12th position for TS Corsa, the Irishman. And then Kai Van Berlo in the first of the United Autosports cars. He's running in 13th place right now. There are places to be gained on pace here, no doubt about it. Well, this not least, fifth place in GT3, because here comes Michelo Pedersen from a long way back. He's very sideways indeed into turn three, but got it done, I think. Can Fabi Fabio Babini fight back into Virage du Comp? No chance. And the Porsche has to follow the 88 car through into turn six. And that was a hard charging Pedersen then between turns two and three made the move stick. It's almost like a chase to get to the Mistral, at which point the Honda is just in a different league. Yeah. Yeah, and already pulling. I mean, this will be a good visible che visual check actually of the Honda versus any other car in the GT3s. Um, it just hasn't got a hope the Porsche in comparison. I'm, I'm visualising the fitting of a tow hook to those cars for the next race. Quite possibly so. Uh, it was surprising to many of us quite how much pace they showed in the earlier sessions in the week, actually, or the weekend in free practice, but they were happy to finish those sessions one, two, and three. Uh, didn't quite get the one, two, three in qualifying earlier today, but now come the race, there is no doubt about where they're finding all of their speed. And yes, a perhaps a minor balance of performance adjustment speed. to be done yeah. for, in time for Imola. Reduction in required number of wheels, maybe. <laughs> but, that, would, uh, that would sort it out, yeah. But, uh, no, it's a bit of great performance from them. You know, I'm not going to say faultless, there was the stumble for the number 44 car with the start we heard from Jens Muller we had a bit of an offer on the cars as well but uh, boy we're delighted to have them in this field oh yeah uh, as striking as they look and I made the point earlier on that their awning and how the cars are presented there uh, has taken some thought but when you stand in front of their facility it is very very impressive and clearly been you know a number of months if not years in the planning thinking ahead to future gt rules within aco absolutely rules racing it's good to see three car honda team being added to the list of things invented in denmark that includes google maps and the light machine gun as well as lego I would have gone with the L word first there, but uh, I can, yeah, fair enough. What, like machine gun? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tom Dillman continues to lead. Uh, 22 and a bit minutes to go. All the pit stops that have been required by teams have been done, plus, unfortunately, some penalties afterwards when certain minimum pit stop reference times will run a little too close. This is a good fight in the closing stages between TS Corsa in 12th and the 32 car that was started by Daniel Schneider but is now being driven by Kai van Berlo and applying the pressure to Irishman Kean Carey. So Carey choosing his line out of turn 14, but he's gone to the right now. Will he dive to the left in 
the last possible moment. Just edging Kai van Berlo to one side of the road, but won't be able to cover now the advances of the young Ooh. Dutchman. Carey on the ragged edge, and van Berlo will go through. Excellent stuff from van Berlo. Good defence from Kim Carey. But uh, car 20, meanwhile, is going to be in uh, some trouble. Optima Motorsports, Alex Mortimer reported to the stewards for abusing track limits. And for that matter, the United Autosports team manager has been called to race control for car two. That is the car currently pedalled by Max Lynn. Carey leaping over the kerbs there in order to make up for lost time, but uh, there'll be no hanging over, hanging on to, I should say, Kai Van Berlo's coat tails. That ship has sailed to a certain extent. Way down the Mistral Strait, he goes. Now, what happened to the CD Sport car? This time very, very wide, and the rejoin was a little bit nip and tuck. And tyres will not have been in a great, uh, great uh, condition either, having been out in the marbles, but it does look like that car made the right hand. There's Sean Tong at the wheel of the CD Sport car. But that's allowed Tommy Foster through and into yes. fifth place for the RLRM Sport 53 team. Tommy is flying, so a slower lap for Sean Tong there. Colin Noble, meanwhile, right with Ryan harper and goes by him as I speak, up into seventh place, so racking up the points. And Colin's next target is, though, 13 seconds away, and that is Sean Tong. Matt Bell is three seconds back from harper -Ellum. Was there some contact a moment or two ago at turn five? No, the two car just going a little too deep into Virage Dupont. That was Max Lynn. Th this pair, this is the battle for second place. Louis Rousset under real pressure now from Dino Lenardi and trying to soak it up. So Rousset, second position, and uh, yeah, has allowed that seven second gap to emerge from his nose to the rear of uh, Tom Dillman's car. And Rousset now having to drive the widest Ligier possible to keep behind him a similar car of Frenchman Dino Lunardi for Edex Board. To drive through penalty for Alex Mortimer. He's going to wait down the field in 20th place via lose that, lose that uh, top 20 position with that drive through. Track limits. Another one to add to a fairly long list by this point. I would warn, by the way, uh, regular viewers of the Michelin Le Mans Cup that we are within the last 25 minutes, and we all know what that means, don't we? Anything don't can happen. Don't go away. Anything. In other words. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's uh, slightly less action than we've had in previous years because there's no longer the extra pit stop. However, yeah. this championship always has a habit of producing something we didn't expect. And always in the final round of the season as well, at Portimao, that's just... Uh, your brain is scrambled by the end of that Michelin Le Mans Cup event, and I'm sure it will go completely down to the wire this year as well. As now, via, uh, Louis Rousset into turn five, he goes, and the Ferrari very nearly drifting across the yep. bows of Dino Lunardi. He had to force the issue to a certain extent, but contact was avoided. Neatly done by Rousset. Did what he could to put uh, some clear blue sky between himself and his tormentor. Did that, actually. I think grabbed a few tenths there. Not under as immediate a threat as he was this time, at this point on the last lap. It's 0.478 of a second as they came through the end of the first sector. It's yeah, it is an extra couple of tenths. So Rousset doing what he can to fend off what is not looking inevitable, but certainly possible for what would be an excellent result for Edex Sport in the uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup. I can't recall them being on a podium before. No, no, I, 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 indeed. I think they've been top five in the past, but uh, they will be a first. We will check. 61 Ferrari heading out of uh, over the curbs at turn six with a fair bit of road clear in front now. Third position for the AF Corsa yeah, car of but, Montemini. But becoming under more pressure from Teo Nue in the Aston Martin that is catching under, under seven and a half seconds now was two seconds a lap quicker last time around. This isn't done. The Aston Martin after losing almost a minute to that, uh, that, that uh, mistake in the pit stop could still make the podium. And uh, 
a question of what might have been had they not lost effectively an additional 30 seconds serving the penalty. Yes, there's the 30 seconds that it didn't uh, sit stationary for, but uh, far better, more preferable to lose a second or two in the pit stop itself than have to soak up an additional half minute in serving the penalty afterwards. But they'll learn these little lessons. Alex Morton, by the way, has served his drive-through penalty, drops the car from 20th to 24th place. That's how costly that's, uh, that can be at this point in the race. Yeah. Tom Dillman looking increasingly comfortable here in the lead. The racetrack on our graphic just looks so busy. You can't take your eyes off this traffic. But nearly nine seconds now, an advantage for Tom Dillman. And he has already dispatched the 46 Ebby Motors Porsche. So for a brief period, can relax in the knowledge that uh, he got a couple of corners ahead of him that are completely free of any sort of traffic. So what's going on in terms of potential battles in this almost the last quarter of an hour? Well, second place overall is still very much up to grabs between Lou Rousset and Dino Leonardi. Fourth place, Tommy Foster is closing in on Leo Weiss. Colin Noble is closing the gap rapidly to Sean Tong. That would be for sixth position. And uh, Matt Bell is doing a similar job on the Graf Racing car in eighth, the 57 car of Ryan Harper Ellum. And that gap is under three seconds now. Straight across the higher friction tarmac for Alexander Taukanitsa Jr. at turn two. And that car looks quite a handful at this stage of the race. 18th position for the AT Racing Ligier, which just straight line the second corner. And uh, race control will have to judge whether any firm advantage was taken there. Tom Dillman at turn five, Virage du Comte, and now working his way around six and through the kink at seven. Onto the Lindois du Mistral for yet another time. This will be lap 47 for the race leader. Almost 11 seconds better off than Louis Rousset for NV2S Forestier Racing. Dino Lunardi, Leo Weiss, Tommy Foster are the top five. And it's very tight indeed still between Leo Weiss and Tommy Foster. Less than a second separate the WTM Racing pole sitting car, remember, led for a long time as well. But that RLRM Sport car is closing in. He's reeling him in, isn't he? And he's reeling him in reasonably quickly. Whether or not he can get by that car. Still very engaging stuff up and down this field. Lots of gaps that are ebbing and flowing. Further, a couple of tenths taken out of the advantage of Leo Weiss just in that last sector by Tommy Foster. A good run from him. In, in uh, GT, it's a Honda 1-2. Montemini still being caught, by the way. Another second taken out of that advantage by the Aston Martin. Oh, way, way, way off by... Which is that? Is that the number two? Yes. yes. It's Max Lynn. I don't know if I've woken him up. <laughs> it's the 55 car leader in LMP, in LMP, in GT3. And potential history to be made here, by the way, in GT3. Uh, because if either the 55 or indeed the second place car, the 44, takes the win, it will be the first ever win globally for this current evolution of the Honda NSX. Right, yes. The first podium came for Gradient Racing at Long Beach last weekend. Yeah. And the Evo 2022, which is what it's called, it's the Honda, or the Acura in the US, uh, NSX GT3, Evo 2022, a first global win. And a truly international car, remember, it's a Japanese brand, the car built, de uh, designed and built um, in the United States. Road car comes with hybrid drive, of course, not this GT3 version, but the race cars designed and built in Italy by Jazz Motorsports uh, just outside Milan. With a huge history, of course, with Honda and touring car racing. Mm. Car. So, but uh, yeah, it will be a, a crucial part of the Honda NSX uh, history. Uh, most this, certainly will be. be. Yeah, will be noted down for years to come if they get there. 
and two of their cars have appeared very dominant to this point so far. They're not going to get a 1-2-3 finish, very likely 1-2. You said that out loud, you realised that. There's, 50, I did. there's, there's 12 and a half minutes to go. And yeah, but look at the happen. gaps, look at the gaps from Michelo Pedersen. I mean, it'd be right, great just if it could happen. It down. 12, 12 minutes, this is what he said. <laughs> yeah, good way to start the season, wouldn't it? With a, with a dominant statement that proved to be entirely inaccurate. Well, we're going to hear the Danish national anthem by the sound of things. Well, it'd been a while, well, perhaps first time ever in Michelin Le Mans Cup. Can't think when we would have heard it otherwise. No, I think you're probably right. And we've heard uh, lots oh, of... big lock-up by the number 11 car. Yes, it was. Now, where is the CD Sport car of Sean Tong? Tommy Foster's buying, by the way, he's yeah. up into fourth. So there you go, that's the first place change for the highest positioned Duquesne. Sean Still, Tong for CD Sport is a further nine seconds away, but that doesn't necessarily take into account that moment for Vice. 8.6 is more like it, might be closer to seven by the time things settle down. Kean Carey and Wayne Boyd. So you've got uh, Ireland versus Northern Ireland here, 13th and 14th positions, working their way through Gala Bank corner and into Virage du Lac. Kian Carey, second year with the TS Corsa team in this car. Plugging away at this. This is championship winning driver Wayne Boyd, pretty much a master of the LMP3 art. Just where are the relative strengths and weaknesses of these cars? Car 46 reported to the stewards again for abusing track limits. And Wayne Boyd is through. That didn't take long. Kian Carey trying to get the Duquesne turned in as quickly as possible into Turn 1, but the Ligier of United Autosports that was doing the chasing looking eminently more manoeuvrable at this stage of the race. We are just outside the 10-minute marker of this 1 hour and 50-minute race, adjusted, remember, for 2022, with 10 minutes shaved off the race time, but it hasn't detracted at all so far. And uh, if things continue like this for the rest of the season, we'll be very happy chappies in the commentary box. It's a quick shot there of the Ryder Engineering car coming down towards scene corner. At the moment, that uh, car in 10th is the best placed of our debuting teams, but under pressure from second year team, Team Tour, and banging on the door here of a top 10 finish. Matt Salihaug just ahead of the chasing Michael Markerson. Tor looking for a way by left or right, doesn't really matter to uh, get ahead. It might all be down to where the car can be placed on the next lap, though. Difficult to get the required drive out of a very slow speed Virage du Pont, although it's not the ideal run for Mads coming out of turn 14. Wasn't quite close enough to pounce uh, Markerson. Michael Markerson over the line, sharing the car with Auden Goodmanson. Markson from Denmark, Goodmanson, of course, of Iceland. Yeah. As our team tour themselves. Yep, team tour. Icelandic and proud of it, supported by High Class Racing this year. It's a drive through penalty, by the way, for car number 20 for not respecting track limits. That is the Optimum Motorsport. That's a second drive through penalty. That's for full course yellow procedures. Apologies this time. So that is Alex Mortimer will be making a second run down pit lane, having recovered from 24th to 22nd. That work is going to be undone again, I'm afraid. It's going to be a frustrating afternoon for Alex Mortimer. Tommy Foster working very hard to close the gap to Dino Lenardi in a podium position. It's under seven seconds. He's just put in a purple sector in the middle sector of Paul Ricard. That's going to be one to watch. Mm. That's yeah, Tommy a Foster statement may, of purpose, isn't it? May not be done yet, and there is a podium up for grabs. Running in fourth at the moment, Dino Lunardi, the man who stands in his way. And actually, Louis Rousset is only 2.4 seconds further ahead. Yep. Still, Mad Seilerhaug hanging on to this position for the time being. Michael Markerson trying all sorts of weird and wonderful lines in and out of Bose. Say there's a Ferrari as well that they've Good got to there. get round. Yeah, it wasn't ideal for the Ryder engineering car. Much cleaner for Team Tour. But the net effect might not come into fruition until 
the final corner and Team Tour trying to get down the inside there in that classic Lucas Delay manoeuvre, but it was covered off by the rider engineering car of Matt Seilerhaug and he stays in front for the time being. This one's going to run and run, isn't it? Uh, meantime, Colin Noble, two seconds back from Sean Tong now. Michael Markerson and Matt Seilerhaug Right together with Seen, Matt Bell under three seconds back from Ryan Harper Ellen. These are all for top, top ten positions, and these points are going to count. Drive through for car 46, abusing track limits. Drive through for car 30, abusing track limits. And Still there's another off. For yes, there was. The which of the. Just trying to check that out on the track at 32, most likely, although the two, the two car was in that sort of two. area as well. Yeah, it's two's a, been delayed I'm heavily. I'm afraid it's, it's, um, it's Max Lane, and he's yeah. not having a great afternoon, is he? And he hasn't yet pinged through the end of that first sector, so it might be that he just didn't make the loop at all, didn't go through the marker points, effectively, yeah. because he was so far wide. And that will, his uh, lap will have to be inserted again manually by our timekeepers. For all very, very deep indeed on the inside there of uh, Senior Corner. That was Mad Seilerhaug having to dodge around a recovering United Order Sports car, I think, and got off onto the dust on the right hand side. So that was Max Lynn that they were lapping. And it meant that the run then in through Senior Corner itself was very hairy indeed for Mad Seilerhaug with no grip on those Michelin tyres. And it's Kai Van Berlo catching both of them. I haven't spotted that, but that's Kai Van Berlo, one of those two United Autosports cars. In the car. second of those cars, then, because the two is... No, no, it's a 32. Yeah, he's so got you're right, by. he's got ahead of the two. Oh, big... But another lock-up there for the right car. Ragged so, edge stuff. Team Tour looking for a way through. United are going to be looking for a way through both of them. Five and a half minutes left. I'll keep an eye on the rest of these battles. Tommy Foster still catching. Under five seconds now off the podium. Over line they go, another warning flag this time for the abusive track limits for the 31 car of AF Corsa, that's the prototype for AF Corsa, now driven by Rui Aguash. Bullet racing, by the way, under two and a half seconds from the podium in GT right now. Closing in on Andrea Montemini. Oh, very wayward indeed for both of them. And that's a result of a spin for Michael Markerson and through spreading the eye of the needle, Kai Van Berlo. Did he pick both of them off? The 77 team tour car heavily no. delayed. Not quite ahead of Matt Seilerhaug. It was Seilerhaug's moment that Markerson reacted to and lost his car completely. And Kai Van Berle read it perfectly and at least got around the 77. So Seilerhaug, one heck of a tank slapper and trying to avoid it and it resulted in spin for the Danish driver Michael Markerson. Oh. Otherwise, it would have been perfect for Team Tour to probably have taken that place away from Reiter Engineering and instead all of that hard work from the Dane in the Icelandic prepared car, or Danish prepared car for Icelandic team, uh, they have to do all their hard work again. They're a factor this, this year. They've shown that anybody battling for a top ten in this field is going to be a factor, and they've done that most of the afternoon. Here's Kai Van Berlo now looking to roughhouse his way by uh, the Reiter Engineering 76 car. Goes wide over the curbs it's looking very ragged isn't it at the moment for the the also pretty close cd sport and nielsen racing so this is colin noble he's taking the place sean tong he's so, taking the place yeah, he's moved ahead of sean tong the driver from hong kong and uh, edinburgh based colin noble into the top six in their defense along with tony wells of last year's title right engineering now really being pressured hard by Kai Van Berlo of the Netherlands. It's another but example, isn't it, with the writer car clearly trimmed for speed, but struggling around sector one and sector three, yeah. and really having to tough it out. Meanwhile, Team Tour in the background looking to get ahead of, I think, Max Lynch, so that yeah, wouldn't correct. be for position. No. As the front wheels of Kai Van Berlo are nearly level with Mads Seilerhaug as they Work their way along that short straight between oh, five and wide. six. He was very wide indeed, Seilerhaug. And that not the perfect line through seven. Surely this is Van Berlo's chance now. He'll use the slipstream and uh, the car in front will not be able to get to the same sort of speed at the same pace, you would think. 
Although Siler House car is that one that's been trimmed out and therefore yeah. is competitive down the Mistral straight. Von Berlo needs to get the overtake done just before the braking area. Is he going to be oh, braking? Of course done he it. is. Of course he is. Just done it. Round the outside will go Von Berlo to take that place away from Reiter Engineering. That is the 11th spot. No, it's not. It's 10th, in fact. It's 10th. Already it ahead on our spot. timing screen. So quickly has it updated. Matt Bell is right with Ryan Harper Allen for eighth position. Colin Noble, 2.6 seconds from Leo Weiss and five seconds quicker last time around. He can do that. Lou, Lou Rousset has seen off at the moment the challenge from Dino Lonardi. Tommy Foster, three and a half seconds back, but running out of time. Matt Bell trying to force a mistake from Ryan Harper Ellen. Harper Ellen in the graph car, the black nose, as it, uh, they head into turn number three at Virage de la Hotel. And in GT, we've got the Aston Martin, which is under a second behind Andrea Montemini. Tio Nui has fought back and is right with the ex Formula One driver for again for a podium position. On to the Mistral goes the eighth place fight then. Graf versus Nielsen. Von Berlo is 15 seconds adrift, so that's as high up the order as he's going to get. Tommy Foster's just done the fastest middle sector of anybody again. Laurence Hoare, by the way, has levered the fastest lap back from um, Wayne Boyd. It's down to a 150.480. He did that on lap 38. Round the outside goes Matt Bell to take the place away from Ryan Harper Ellum. Set that up all the way down the Mistral and the Duquesne looking very strong indeed. Onto the brakes in time for Bose and cements the place Matt Bell. So Matt Bell then takes the number four car up now into eighth position. Tommy Foster with 35 seconds on the clock. It's the last lap for the leader. Leader at the moment is coming through turn six. The, uh, this Team Virage car looking pretty racy, but he's not on the lead lap, no. so uh, even if that car got in front, the positions would not change. You're talking about the advances of Teo Nue for Bullet Racing and the Aston Martin, right with Andrea Montemini. He's only got five seconds left on the clock. Now, where's the race leader overall on the Mistral straight? So heading around now to the end of the lap. And I think ahead of this pair. It is. He yeah, is. So this will confirm it will be the last lap for these guys we as go. well. This is the one and only opportunity, really, for Teo Nue, who's got a cracking run on Gustav Birch. And can he do a match? Well, yes, he can around the outside. Stupendous overtake and had to do it the hard way because they soaked up a penalty as well for a breach of significant breach of minimum pit stop reference time. Not Gustav Birch, remember, Andrea Montemini. Oh, sorry, yes. So that will put Teo Nui up into a podium finishing position. Yeah, so onto the podium for Teo Nui, but to Tom Dillman in the number 10, Racing Spirit of Le Mans crew, along with Matt Alexander Maxwell, will head out of the final corner and take the chequered flag. A win for Tom Dillman and the racing spirits of the Mon team. Round one of the 2022 Michelin Le Mans Cup. What a race for the Michelin Le Mans Cup in 2022 to kickstart Lucas Delay with a dramatic victory for Racing Spirit of Le Mans for Tom Dillman and Alexander Maxwell and a win in the GT3s for the debut team for, from Denmark, GMB Motorsport, Kasper H. Jensen and starting the 55 car was Christian Poulsen. Yet to come home the 55, the 44 and the 99 are home. Confirmed in second and third. First, second, third have been confirmed in LMP3. Tommy Foster at close to under a second. Here comes the 55. GMB Racing's 55 Honda NSX GT3 2020 Evo. A global first for the Danish team. That's the first win in competition anywhere in the world for the current iteration of the Honda NSX GT3. A Japanese car, 
built for the road in America, built and designed for the racetrack in Italy. Fantastic stuff from the Danish team, and I'm sure a lot more to come. You can see emotion in the cockpit there. A 1-2 in their debut for GMB Motorsports. And a very different looking 1-2-3, Johnny, for the overall. Yeah, uh, refreshing, because Racing Spirit of Le Mans have toyed with top tens in the past, but uh, a quite a statement to everybody else in the championship. MV2S Forestier Racing, uh, they have, again, been inching their way closer to top tens, the odd top six here and there as well, but a second place finish mightily impressive for Louis Rousset and his teammate at MV2S, Jerome de Sandalia. Uh, before we get to the celebrations underneath the podium, uh, another position change on the last lap. Nielsen Racing's number seven car, Colin Noble, got by Leo Weiss for fifth position just before the flag. Excellent stuff. Edex brought home in the number 17 car in third position for CR Cruz and Dino Lunardi. And it's a GMB Motorsport 1 2 ahead of Tio uh, Nue and his teammate at uh, Bullet Racing, Stephen Patrick. Stephen Patrick. Yep. So, number 99, Bullet Racing Aston Martin. Did not have the best of starts to the weekend, but a hell of a good finish to that race. But. First time winners here in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, racing Spirit of Le Mans with Tom Dillman, bringing that car home. Very happy indeed with their afternoon's work in glorious sunshine that remains here at Le Castellet. Racing Spirit of Le Mans become new winners in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Didn't really put a wheel wrong throughout the course of the race, and that's what it requires these days yep. to win one of these races. Matchell pressurising the, uh, well, Jerome de Sadelier throughout his stint, and of course at the time the 11 car looking very dominant indeed. Now that uh, Tom Dillman is home, much conversation being had, not only with the team, but also with his co-driver as well. He had to do the hard work in the first couple of laps of his stint, so no time at all to adjust to the conditions, and get used to the car, push hard, and then try and maintain that gap, which actually stands at 18 and a half seconds by the end of a, an hour and 50 minutes. Still very warm out there as well, 21.3 degrees, you can see, on the gantry as home comes the race winning GMB Motorsport Honda Casper H Jensen very pleased indeed with that result <laughs> the group photographs that we'll be seeing in forthcoming publications being taken thirsty work I'm sure for Tom Dillman but uh, Alexander Matchell has had some time to chill off chill out a little bit and uh, cool down as the 55 GMB Motorsport Honda arrives on the scene as well. Kasper H. Jensen bringing that car home with Christian Poulsen, the bronze-rated driver, providing the foundation in the first half of the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Opening race of the season. That's the reaction from GMB Motorsport then. It'll be a 1-2 finish for that crew with Gustav Birch and Jens Moller doing hard work as well. So, a chance now for Haley to have a word with Tom Dillman and the important work he did in the early stage of the stint. I'm joined, I'm joined here by the winners in the LMP3 category, drivers of car number 10, Racing Spirit of Le Mans. Tom, uh, what a fantastic stint out there. Just tell us how it was for you. Congratulations, firstly. Uh, what a great drive from you. Yeah, but to be honest, my teammate uh, gave me an easy life. Uh, he did a super first stint. So I just had to focus on doing the, the undercut, pushing on the outlap and the first push, and we could uh, jump to, to the lead. And then uh, we're just uh, managing from there. So easy life thanks to this guy. Great effort, of course, from you, Alexander. Uh, and of course, a great start to the season for you. Yeah, it's a great start. I must say it's a little bit emotional even because then when I think three weeks, three weeks back, I was not expecting that I'm here. It's the Easter weekend and I was planning with my family to Mallorca. Uh, my family is now here, and uh, but because uh, Racing Spirit of Le Mans gave me the opportunity to drive here, and it was a great weekend, I must say. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great exchange, and you're right not to go on holiday. So, uh, yeah, well done for your victory, guys. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Le Castellet, the scene of the opening round of the Michelin Le Mans Cup for 2022. Blue sky all around the circuit Paul, Paul Ricard for race number one of seven this year. And we're going to be going to Italy twice to Le Mans for the road to Le Mans and to Belgium and Portimao to complete the season. Loads of racing for these cars and uh, a fit to bursting grid. 31 LMP3s, seven GT3s got underway just after 4.30 this afternoon. And uh, amazingly, many of them did get through the first couple of corners unscathed. A good getaway for Torsten Kratz, who was chased all the way by Jerome de Sadelia. Further back, one or two incidents, including for Freddie Hunt, who nearly lost the car in a massive way down the Mistral straight. Very good car control in the Reiter Engineering LMP3. Early stops then for the GMB Motorsport car. Uh, that was uh, the car coming in for a penalty after a jump start for Jens Moller and some overtakes between Ebi Motors and AF Corsa. They've been old foes going back through the archives. This a frightening moment for Klaus Abelan at senior corner. They very, very rapid right-hander and a full course yellow would be issued to retrieve a stray bollard at Virage du Comp at turn five. Brave Marshall picking that up and getting it back very swiftly indeed. There was a spin for Jerome de Sadelier. Hadn't quite expected the tyre degradation to fall off as significantly as it did in his first ever prototype uh, uh, LMP3 race on loads of radicals in the past. Also, rather wayward coming out of Virage Dupont between the 14 car and a recovering 43. That would result in a puncture, some contact at the final corner. Pit stops started in anger. Remember, a mandatory pit stop required, along with a driver change, run to a minimum pit stop reference time. And Tom Dillman, who took over the number 10 racing spirit of Le Mans car, had no moment's peace at all. Needed to get his sleeves rolled up as quickly as possible to dispatch the number 11 car of Leo Weiss, which he did with aplomb, and then presented by a rejoining MV2 US Forestier racing car number 29, Louis, uh, Louis Rousset taking over from Jerome de Sadelier and Rousset could not hang back the rapid Frenchman Tom Dillman in car number 10 in that teal and black car going to the race lead and eventually he would stretch his legs to over 18 seconds. So car 10 for racing spirit of Le Mans who've always traditionally been wedged down into the lower order of the top 10 and beyond but they have done a really good job today to take victory. Congratulations to Tom Dillman and the man who set the foundation, Alexander Matchell. That's what it means to the Swiss squad. And in their debut for the Michelin Le Mans Cup, JMB Motorsport, a 1-2 finish, 55 finishing ahead of 44. Time for the podium, but actually before we get to that, we can go back to GMB Motorsport and hear from one of their drivers, Christian Poulton, who Haley has managed to get, get, uh, get hold of before the podium actually starts. Firstly, Christian, congratulations. A lot of firsts hit for you today. First time Michelin Le Mans Cup. Uh, first victory uh, in the, for the NSX here as well. And also, um, uh, after seven years break, I mean, that's a lot of firsts and a lengthy gap uh, after a break. How do you feel? Yeah, it was a fantastic. Uh, really good start for, the, uh, for a new Danish team and uh, with a new car and uh, yeah, a new teammate for me. Uh, and after seven breaks and then uh, seven years of break and then, and, and then win. So it was fantastic. Absolutely. You were able to take advantage of the penalties of the number 88 and 44 cup for, for jump starting, putting yourself uh, in the lead. Yeah, it was, uh, there's a lot of car in, cars in the start and you really have to be, be careful uh, what you do because uh, you can easily on, on this track uh, jump start uh, because it's so, so the starting line is far away. So, so we have to re really be, be careful. But uh, I took it easy and, yeah, and the others made a mistake. So, so that, was, um, that was a good start. Your strategy paid off. Well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Christian Paulson, it's fantastic to have him back Isn't with his it? pedigree in the FIA World Endurance Championship. So many Le Mans to look back on as well. Um, Last international race we believed to be in the WC in 2014 when he won the title. Yes. Which is some break. points. Yeah, indeed so. So seven years away from ACO rules racing. He's done some TCR racing, 
and uh, actually appeared a couple of times in the World Rally Championship as well. Um, but this is his first competitive action in anger within this these championship pools. 55 laps completed for Racing Spirit of Le Mans for Tom Dillman and teammate Alexander Matchell, finishing ahead of Jerome de Sadelier and uh, Louis Rousset for MV2S. Dino Lunardi and teammate in the uh, James Winslow um, in the 17 car, sorry, Charlie Cruz rather, and Dino Lunardi in the Ligier for EDEX Sport, ahead of RLRM Sport. Colin Noble and Tony Wells, defending champions, finish in the top five in the end, so that will get their uh, points tally ticking over nicely. Leo Weiss and Torsten Kratz from pole position slip back to sixth. Certain bits of that race did not quite go to plan, but the opening stint from Torsten was stupendous, and at least he brought the car in from the race lead for the pit stops. CD Sport of Spain finished seventh, ahead of Nielsen Racing's second car. Graf from France, ninth, and it's United Autosport's best car in tenth place for Kai von Berlo and quite a drive to the finish there for him. GT3, first and second, as mentioned, GMB Motorsport. Uh, third position for Bullet Racing and uh, an overtake done on the final lap by Teo Nui, Stephen Patrick, his co-driver in the 99, ahead of the AF Corsa number 61 Ferrari of Giorgio Forgione and Andrea Montemini. The third of the GMB Motorsport Honda NSXs finishing in fifth place ahead of another AF Corsa Ferrari and Ebi Motors Porsche in seventh position. Could have been a lot, lot better for the Italian crew with the German car. EB Motors... Um, Remembering how tough this championship is to get good results, although they are former race winners, and that was five years ago now. As we said a little earlier, a very different looking podium, and all the better for that, actually. Good to see some of these teams coming back with refreshed efforts, being rewarded for those labours. Josh Skelton there from Cool Racing. Not the best day for Cool Racing, I'm afraid. That 69 car, not Josh's car, the other car grinding to a halt and uh, not seeing Martha Jakobsen really feature in this race. But a uh, great day for Racing Spirit of Le Mans. Um, oddly enough, used to be the service provider for Cool Racing uh, before setting out on their own. MV2S concentrating this year on the Michelin Le Mans Cup and clearly that's paid off for them. And then Edex Sports, long-term supporters of this package and I think by far their best result. Olivier Panis there. Uh, winners from GMB Racing and second place as well. So much discussion to be had after a, a fraught race and you don't want to break the concentration during the hour and 50 minutes, but now a chance to reflect. That is all three crews actually from the Honda mm. team. So that faint but uh, recognisable haze in the distance. Le Castellet perfectly placed in terms of its uh, scenery and weather, to be honest. Nice and high, a perfect place for an airport, great place for a racetrack as well. It has been the case for a little over 50 years now. Final preparations being made ahead of the podium. And it will, I think, be LMP3s first of all, followed by the GT3s with the setting sun in the background. Team personnel needing to be in position as well. Great that we can finally be back to a traditional podium as well without the need for social distancing, without the need for COVID masks as well. The decision was make it, taken before the start of the season that this would be a mask-free event. And a situation that will be continually monitored, I'm sure. So Edex Sport ready to be brought forward. Dino Lunardi and Charles Cruz in their Ligier. And Edex Sports uh, will be a team to look out for in tomorrow's European Le Mans Series race as well. But here they come to get the trophies then. It is Edex Sport in third position in the first race of the Michelin Le Mans Cup.
Paul, thumbs up there, I noticed from Paul Shata, who is very much invested in Edex Sport as well. So he's delighted to see fellow members of their crew doing so well in the first major race of the Michelin Le Mans Cup this year. First major race of the weekend as well. Second place going the way of MV2S Forestier Racing and their duo of drivers, Jerome de Sadelier and Louis Rousset. But the win, first win of the season, first win of their Michelin Le Mans Cup career going to Tom Dillman and Alexander Matchell together with the racing spirit of Le Mans crew on top of the podium. Round one of the Michelin Le Mans Cup is won by racing spirit of Le Mans. And we will hear the national anthem of Switzerland for Racing Spirit of Le Mans right now. Michelin caps going back on for all seven members then on the podium and trophies will be held aloft for all the photographs to be taken. And then there are seven bottles of champagne to be cracked open. Some may be kept, I suppose, but uh, in the true tradition of Le Mans, most need to be sprayed and that's exactly what's going to happen by the looks of things. A very warm podium is about to become a pretty damp one as the champagne is sprayed at the end of the first Michelin Le Mans Cup event of the season here at Le Castellet. It's a win for Racing Spirit of Le Mans, second place for MV2S Forestier Racing and Edex Sport back third position with Dino Lunardi and Charles Cruz. Well done to all involved, Graham. Great stuff, great race, good fun that one, and uh, free of really major drama, plenty of actual racing drama, plenty of off-track moments, but uh, most of the action was kept to good, hard racing, and that's what we like to see. Michelin Le Mans Cup producing the goods here for round one. And as we've said a couple of times, I'll say it one more time, it's nice to see some new teams, and you know, rather different teams, and new faces, on an overall podium and we're going to see more of those for the second podium for the GT3 class and a brand new national anthem for the championship yes so we will wait for that and GMB Motorsport confirmation of the points then uh, accrued for the top class, the LMP3s, Racing Speed, Spirit of Le Mans will leave with 25 points, MV2S 18, Edex Sport 15, RLRM Sport finishing in fourth position, get 12 points ahead of WTM Racing and Nielsen Racing 11 and 8 respectively, WTM getting 10 plus the extra point that they earned earlier on today for pole position. And a little further down the order, if you finish outside of the top 10, but do finish, you get half a point. Matchell and Dillman, Alexander and Tom will get 25 points each. Jerome de Sadelier and teammate Louis Rousset, 18. And uh, so it f continues further down. So third position on the GT3 podium for Bullet Racing's Stephen Patrick and Theo and Nouet of Great Britain and France respectively. The first crew from GMB Motorsport finishing in second place, Gustav Birch and Jens Moller, 44. And the win will go to another GMB Motorsport crew from 55 car, Kasper H. Jensen and Christian Poulsen now working their way forward. Fists clenched, champagne awaits them on the top step of the podium.
And that is the podium at the end of round one of the Michelin Le Mans Cup here at Lucastelet. It's a one-two finish for GMB Motorsport. Here's the national anthem for the first time of Denmark. The national anthem of Denmark, the national anthem for GMB Motorsport, and they're joined on the top step of the podium, the two drivers, by Kasper Elgard, who is the team manager, effectively, of GMB Motorsport, but a name I'm sure that too many will know from racing circles in the past. So great that he can join in with the celebrations as the champagne sprays at the end of the GT3 podium. It's a GMB Motorsport 1-2, 25 points and 19 for car 44 because they got, they got pole earlier on this season. AF Corsa shown in third that there, intriguingly. Um, but uh, it was definitely the two Aston Martin drivers yes. on the third step of the podium. I didn't misidentify them, did I? No. OK, well, we'll check that. Uh, Andrea Montemini and Gino, for, for Gino Forgione uh, should be in fourth position and therefore yeah. getting 12 points rather than 15. Well, there we are. I hope that was enough entertainment for you. Frankly, it might have been enough entertainment for about four races, but thankfully we've got lots more racing in the Michelin Long, Le Mans Cup to come, including in a month's time in Emilia-Romagna around the historic Imola Grand Prix circuit. We'll look forward to that. Join Graham Goodwin and me, Johnny Palmer, in about four weeks' time. Bye-bye for now.